second plenary session. Uh, our speaker will be Professor Vlasov from General Physics Institute, and he will speak on a new application of nanotechnologies, nanoparticles for sensing of temperature, which is again between two fields of research, nanotechnology and biophotonics. And uh, please. Thank you very much for, uh, first of all, uh, to organizing committee for uh, possibility to <coughs> present my uh, recent research to share with you our res uh, research of our laboratory uh, related with uh, uh, diamond nanothermometer. Uh, uh, from beginning, uh, uh, I show you uh, what we talk about. Uh, so we start from uh, uh, discussion what is temperature and the correctness of its uh, measurement uh, at nanoscale. Then uh, I uh, present you uh, nano diamonds which we develop and uh, uh, tell you about relation uh, these nano diamonds with temperature. And finally, uh, I, I show you our uh, recent uh, invent, uh, diamond nano thermometer and uh, uh, hybrid system, the diamond uh, heater thermometer, and uh, its uh, very uh, its application in biology. Some some example of application. Uh, so uh, allow me to to uh, to do a short trip in history. Uh, 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 it is believed uh, that uh, temperature is the uh, most difficult uh, physical parameter, among others. Uh, for comparison, uh, uh, much more easy to understand uh, uh, weight or volume. And uh, from ancient time, people uh, invent uh, different tools for measurement uh, uh, weight and volume. But uh, uh, another situation with temperature. Only in, uh, in the beginning of the 17th century, uh, Galileo, or somebody from his friends, uh, uh, suggested the uh, first, uh, first tool for measuring temperature. Uh, it's called the uh, thermoscope. Uh, so uh, the structure was, uh, design was very simple. It consists of a bulb with air, and, and a thin tube, which uh, uh, inserted in a dish with uh, colored water. So you can uh, uh, qualitatively uh, compare if it's temperature higher or lo lower uh, around. But uh, only uh, in uh, about uh, 20, uh, two, 200 years, uh, uh, Maxwell first suggests a uh, definition for temperature. Uh, this uh, temperature parameter was uh, introduced in physics from Maxwell's uh, distribution of uh, molecule motion in, uh, in ideal gas. And uh, from uh, this uh, equation, uh, uh, it follows that temperature is uh, defined as a microscopic and equilibrium uh, physical parameter characterizing the average uh, kinetic energy of molecules motion in a system. Okay, uh, then uh, from uh, other uh, formula and uh, other law, uh, follow uh, another uh, determination of temperature. Uh, but uh, uh, temperature is uh, de uh, defined as a microscopic parameter. It means, uh, you ask me uh, how we can measure uh, temperature at nanoscale. Uh, 
uh, uh, fluctuation of uh, temperature depend on the number of uh, particles, uh, mole molecule which uh, uh, consist the system, uh, analyzed system. And uh, when we decrease this number, so uh, fluctu fluctuation of parameter uh, uh, increase and uh, we obtain very, very high uh, error in measurements. So we have to determine which uh, uh, critical level uh, at uh, where we can measure uh, temperature uh, safely and reliably. Uh, uh, you, you can see on the, this slide that uh, for uh, uh, water volume uh, in size of about uh, one micrometer, we obtained uh, 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 one billion uh, molecules. So its uh, uh, fluctuation is very low. And uh, when we go uh, down uh, and take uh, 100 nanometer uh, volume of water, uh, we uh, uh, have a still, uh, still uh, acceptable uh, fluctuation in temperature ex expressed as uh, less than uh, 0.1 uh, Kelvin. But the uh, problem start uh, from 10 nanometers. Uh, at, at this level, we have only uh, about uh, 30,000 uh, molecules and uh, uh, fluctuation is about uh, two, 2 Kelvin. So for so some task it's uh, enough, but uh, uh, we have to, uh, to stop at this level, but uh, 10 nanometers and uh, a few, a few tens of nanometers is uh, good for, for analyzing a biological object. <coughs> Uh, uh, I remind you that uh, thickness of membrane, uh, cell membrane, is about 10 nanometers uh, 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 diameter of uh, uh, ionic channel of in, in membrane, also uh, uh, order of uh, uh, 10 nanometers. So, if we will measure, if we alone me to measure temperature at this level, we can open uh, a, a different interest in uh, effect, I, I, I hope. So, uh, next, uh, now we switch on uh, diamond and uh, uh, we talk uh, what is the relation of diamond with uh, temperature. We can uh, uh, produce uh, luminescence uh, diamond uh, incorporating uh, different uh, impurity. Uh, and uh, uh, for instance, uh, we, we can cover all, 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 all uh, uh, visible range from ultraviolet till uh, near infrared. Uh, uh, These different defects emit in a wide uh, optical range. And the uh, advantages of this uh, luminescence is uh, high quantum yield, high uh, photon emission uh, rate for, for single defect, and uh, high photostability. Uh, uh, this is uh, almost... Uh, uh, Permanent stability it's not, doesn't depend on, uh, on time. It, it, it can emit uh, many, many years uh, uh, diamond because uh, defect uh, covered with, uh, with uh, uh, diamond shell, which uh, doesn't allow the uh, environment to, to influence on this, on this uh, emission of these defects. So uh, uh, we analyze uh, some of the uh, emitting defects fluorescence defects, uh, like uh, silicon vacancy defect, uh, uh, a nickel-related defect uh, emitting at uh, 793, uh, germanium vacancy, and uh, uh, you can see uh, uh, typical spectrum for, uh, for example, for silicon uh, vacancy defect, 
uh, line uh, emitter light is very narrow, uh, about uh, three five nanometers uh, in width, and uh, 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 emission is uh, at seven thirty eight. So among uh, analyzing uh, uh, effect, uh, we analyze uh, thoroughly uh, this uh, dependence of this position of this line uh, with temperature and found that the uh, uh, line is shifted uh, with uh, uh, decreasing of temperature. And uh, we choose uh, among analyzed uh, defects, uh, silicon vacancy, because uh, it uh, goes most, uh, uh, it gives uh, most uh, intense uh, luminescence because solubility uh, uh, of silicon highest among uh, other analyzed effects. And uh, this uh, emission is lying in a uh, window of tr transparency uh, uh, of uh, biological tissue. So uh, next we, we will work uh, with uh, mostly with silicon vacancy. So now, uh, uh, to, to, to produce, uh, to, to measure temperature at nano level, we don't need just uh, a diamond with, uh, uh, with defects, uh, luminescent defects. We need to produce uh, small nano, uh, diamonds, which are called nano diamonds. But uh, let me look on situation on market. So most popular uh, for many, many years, most popular uh, diamond, uh, nano diamonds was detonation nano diamond. It uh, produced uh, in a large amount for, for very small money, uh, but uh, emission is very, uh, very broad of this uh, line, so it's impossible to use this uh, nano diamond for, for ther thermometry. Another uh, type of nano diamonds is high pressure, high temperature. But uh, these nano diamonds produced by mechanical milling from, you see, initially uh, people take very nice, very nice diamond. And then uh, after treatment, it looks like uh, broken glass. It's also uh, during this procedure, uh, uh, many defects, uh, structural defects introduced. And uh, uh, because uh, Crystallographic uh, distribution of uh, 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 defects uh, is very non-uniform. Uh, we we have uh, uh, finally we have uh, very uh, uh, very broad distribution of uh, luminescence property uh, for for final materials. So at, at this situation, we decided to develop our. Uh, by our uh, nano diamonds by ourselves with uh, uh, good uh, uh, spectral quality and structural quality. Uh, so we, we use two, two techniques for synthesis of nano diamonds. It's so called uh, bottom, uh, bottom up approach. Uh, uh, first, first technique is high pressure, high temperature. Uh, we, uh, as the starting materials, we, we took uh, 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 adamantane uh, and uh, uh, add uh, different uh, compounds containing uh, si silicon to, to, to produce a luminescence uh, a diamond with uh, luminescence of silicon vacancy centers. <coughs> uh, Advantage of this uh, technique uh, that we can produce uh, a relatively uh, large amount, about uh, 10 milligrams, uh, of, uh, for, for one uh, synthesis cycle. Uh, you can see this uh, uh, from the left, uh, on the left picture, you can see this powder, a white powder, and uh, 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 almost ideal shape of, uh, and structure of uh, uh, yeah, single, single, sin, single uh, nano-diamond crystals. So we managed to produce, uh, 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 ch changing uh, 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 condition uh, for synthesis, uh, pressure and temperature, we managed to produce uh, 
as low as small nanoparticles as two two nanometers, and then uh, changing uh, uh, condition synthesis uh, synthesis condition, we uh, produce uh, different uh, 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 crystals uh, uh, as shown uh, two two hundred nanometers uh, and uh, e even uh, bigger than. Uh, one micrometer. Uh, second, uh, second technique is chemical vapor uh, deposition. Uh, s uh, we use a new, new approach, spontaneous nucleation on specially treated uh, substrate. And uh, for synthesis, we use methane, uh, hydrogen, and silane, I guess. Uh, so again, we produce uh, nano diamonds. Uh, uh, with, uh, with luminescence of silicon vacancy centers. Uh, uh, advantage of this uh, approach is that we uniformly produce, uh, uh, produce uh, uh, particles uniform, uh, enough uniform in size uh, uh, compared to high pressure, high temperature technique. But this advantage is uh, uh, on a, uh, one cycle of synthesis, we produce very small uh, amount, about one microgram. And uh, when we change uh, conditions for synthesis, we can produce polycrystalline uh, particles, the polycrystalline nanodiamond particles, and uh, monocrystalline, as you see again uh, on, the, on the right of uh, this slide. And uh, finally, uh, when we uh, manage to grow uh, luminescence nanocrystals, uh, we ask the question uh, how, how to use them for measuring temperature. Traditional technique is uh, uh, approach is uh, introduce uh, many, many uh, thousands of nano nanoparticles, uh, quantum dots or others, uh, uh, inside of, uh, for instance, if we study uh, cells, inside of cells, and analyze, uh, map uh, luminescence of this, and uh, from this luminescence uh, detect temperature. But uh, uh, for nanodiamond, uh, we cannot produce I, uh, absolutely identical particles. So uh, anyway, we, we find some uh, difference in uh, spectral uh, characteristic for for uh, neighbor particles. So uh, then uh, uh, to, to, uh, to escape this, we have to calibrate each particles, but this is impossible to calibrate uh, thousand particles. And uh, 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 ne next problem, uh, uh, nanodiamonds uh, uh, have tendency to, to aggregate in, in, in water and as a solution. So we need to, to invent some uh, shells for, for each particles, as it's also some headache. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and there are uh, some uh, other problems. Uh, but to, to escape of this, uh, all of these problems, we, uh, 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 our idea was uh, to take only one, one nano diamond, uh, insert, incorporate this in a uh, uh, inner channel of uh, glass capillary, and uh, then uh, uh, put this system in a micro manipulator, which allow us to uh, position in, uh, in the any point which we choose in advance uh, in uh, analyzed system. So <coughs> you see a, a lot of advantages, advantages we obtain with such, such design of uh, thermo nano thermometer. And the main characteristic is the uh, uh, size of sensor, uh, the same as uh, size of diamond. Uh, we can produce luminescence non diamond from uh, 50 nanometers to, till 5 micrometers. This already we call this uh, my, uh, uh, micro, uh, micro thermometer. 
Uh, temperature measurement accuracy is uh, about uh, point Kelvin, uh, point 0.1 Kelvin for a square, uh, uh, square root of uh, uh, hertz. Uh, this is for 200 nanometers uh, uh, particles because uh, if we uh, uh, decrease the uh, size of particles, we, we get uh, not so good uh, uh, accuracy, if we increase size, we uh, uh, obtain e even better accuracy because uh, much brighter luminescence intensity. And sensor, uh, sensor positioning accuracy is uh, about 10 nanometers. It's determined by uh, a man manipulator, which we use. Uh, then uh, temperature measurement frequency uh, could reach uh, up to one kilohertz, and uh, intensity uh, to other uh, 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 in, uh, is this uh, thermometer is uh, insensitive, insensitive to other environment parameters. This is main advantage compared to other uh, other uh, uh, thermometer which uh, used now in uh, in science. So now, uh, briefly, uh, uh, main, main step uh, in, in, des in design of uh, uh, our, uh, our, uh, our device. So we synthesize nano-diamond first step, uh, then we characterize, choose uh, proper, uh, proper size, choose proper uh, uh, spectral characteristic, then we uh, produce this special <coughs> device uh, uh, microcapillary with uh, uh, size of uh, channel uh, in uh, which we need for for uh, proper diamond size, non-diamond size. Then we drop uh, uh, water on a substrate with non-diamond, and uh, <coughs> embed uh, this non-diamond uh, in a capillary channel uh, due to. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, capillary force, uh, which uh, insert uh, water inside of capillar, and then we calibrate uh, uh, this uh, chosen nano diamond, uh, uh, placing it in a thermo stat, and uh, get uh, such a, a calibration curve as you see from the right of the slide. <coughs> First test of, uh, for diamond and thermometer have been done in water. We, uh, we tried to uh, demonstrate uh, uh, excellent uh, ability of our uh, uh, nanothermometer to measure very strong gradient of temperature uh, at submicron uh, scale. So we, for that purpose, we produce uh, 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 by the same, uh, same manner as a nano thermometer, we produce a heater, nano heater, which consists of aluminum particles. Also, we insert them in a, a capillary and uh, 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 try to uh, and, and heat it uh, by laser light and try to measure uh, uh, linear distribution of temperature when we remove our thermometer from uh, from heater. So uh, on the, on the uh, left picture, you see simulated uh, distribution of temperature. It's uh, uh, completely spherical, and uh, influence of uh, uh, diamond on this distribution is shown on a. Uh, uh, right graph. So you see uh, that uh, 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 di diamond really disturb temperature where, when we uh, put uh, them uh, at some uh, small distance from a uh, from, uh, uh, heater. But uh, you see that uh, 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 because uh, uh, thermal conductivity of uh, diamond is uh, one thousandth time uh, higher than in water, uh, uh, actually temperature is averaging uh, inside of diamond. But you see it's unique uh, uh, situation that uh, 
uh, temperature in the middle of diamond is uh, really the same as uh, uh, at the same point uh, when we remove diamond from, from this uh, volume, uh, water volume. So uh, actually we measure correct temperature, even introducing some uh, deviation in temperature by, by diamond. Uh, and here we, uh, it is shown a uh, theoretical simulation and uh, for comparison and uh, our experimental results. And uh, we see that uh, uh, coincidence uh, is very, very high with these results. And uh, problems start uh, from when we uh, close very, uh, very, uh, when we move very close to uh, heater because uh, uh, due to some uh, vibration of our micro manipulator, this uh, error arises. And uh, also, uh, no, not ideal simulation because uh, uh, in re really uh, shape of uh, diamond and uh, heater is not ideally uh, uh, spherical. Uh, but anyway, uh, we managed to demonstrate that we can uh, measure uh, with high uh, accuracy uh, gradients up to 20 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, per, per micrometer. So, uh, uh, recently uh, we talk about what, what uh, uh, how how it we can measure uh, how we can apply our thermometer in biology, but. We start from a recently suggested concept of a thermal signaling concept suggested by a Japanese scientist. And traditionally, it was believed that a chemical reaction is initiate many processes in a cell. But they told that we have to take into account also a thermal signal, maybe thermal signal even more important for, for cell for, to initiate any process in cell compared to chemical, or even it, it is comparable for, for importance. Uh, so uh, now uh, we switch on the uh, application of our uh, nano thermometer in biology. So first experiment uh, have been done with mitochondria isolated from mouse brain. And this is uh, a scheme of uh, our experiment. And uh, We uh, uh, introduced to, uh, to initiate uh, a heat release from mitochondria, which we uh, analyze in uh, which we more, uh, uh, from this mitochondria we prepare uh, solu water solution and uh, uh, analyze this mitochondria in solution. Uh, when we uh, 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 touch. Uh, aggregate of mitochondria with our uh, nanothermometer and uh, eight uh, uncoupler, which uh, influence on mem membrane potential, it decrease uh, this potential and uh, uh, initiate release of, of uh, heat, heat uh, from, uh, from mitochondria. And uh, when we start to, when we add this uh, CCP uh, uncoupler, uh, 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 it is shown by arrow. Uh, uh, just after that, we uh, observe, uh, uh, with help of our thermometer, uh, very strong increase in temperature, uh, very next uh, around uh, of this uh, mitochondria. Uh, I show uh, only three, uh, three uh, example of this heat release, but uh, st uh, we do a lot of experiment with uh, many bounces, uh, 
and uh, we found that uh, uh, highest uh, highest uh, heat release uh, reach uh, 22 uh, degrees Celsius. So uh, main result of, of this our first uh, biological experiment with nanothermometer was uh, a demonstration of uh, uh, heat release uh, from mitochondria uh, which reach, reach 22 uh, degree of Celsius. Uh, uh, for, uh, for information, uh, 10 years ago, uh, very famous uh, uh, French scientist in the Nature uh, publication uh, claims that uh, it's impossible to uh, for mitochondria to heat around uh, 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 space, to heat uh, 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 stronger than uh, one millikelvin. So they use very simple uh, formula for estimation, uh, which include uh, this delivery of power. We, we believe uh, with this estimation, but it also include uh, uh, quarter, uh, con conductivity, uh, thermal conductivity of water and size of uh, 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 size of uh, uh, space, uh, uh, size of uh, uh, mitochondria which release this temperature. But uh, uh, this is without in this uh, estimation because uh, 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 characteristic square is uh, uh, could be uh, much smaller than whole whole sur surface of mitochondria and uh, uh, thermal conductivity is not uh, probably not equal to conductivity of water but uh, conductivity of membrane con uh, membrane uh, could differ strongly compared to conductivity of water that is why such discrepancy between our experimental results and theoretical uh, uh, prediction and uh, uh, you ask me that, uh, of, of course, it's possible, uh, we, we use only for uh, in vitro uh, uh, your real thermometer. Not, not, not correct. We also use our thermometer in, in vivo. Uh, this is uh, uh, experiment in, uh, now in a progress, so I will not talk a lot about this. And uh, we will switch on the uh, uh, second hour invention. Uh, uh, hybrid uh, heater thermometer. Uh, uh, if we uh, take uh, high pressure, high temperature nano diamond, it demonstrate you see uh, a lower uh, uh, dependence, demonstrate very stable uh, independency on, on the laser power which illuminates this nano diamond. But if we illuminate uh, CVD diamond, we see uh, from some level, which is uh, normally about one uh, milliwatt, uh, in increase in uh, temperature. So actually we uh, uh, simultaneously measure temperature and, uh, 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 and heating uh, our thermometer. So it allows us to combine these uh, uh, two devices uh, in, in one. Uh, and uh, this heating due to polycrystallinity of nano diamonds, which we produce by CVD technique, on uh, uh, intergrain uh, 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 surface, we uh, uh, have uh, uh, some amount of uh, uh, graphite, uh, so which uh, efficiently absorb light, uh, laser light. And uh, last experiment. Uh, which we, uh, 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 we carry out uh, to demonstrate uh, availability, application of our this new instrument. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, determine a, a, a possibility to regu regulate uh, free calcium ions in uh, uh, in HALA cell uh, by temperature sim simulation. So uh, you see. Uh, Luminescence of uh, luminescence of uh, fluor four, which is proportional, we introduce in a cell, and this intensity of this luminescence is uh, uh, 
proportional to concentration of calcium. So when we uh, just after uh, heat and pulse, we see this uh, jump in uh, in concentration, a jump in uh, intensity of flow four. So it means that concentra concentration of calcium increase in a cell. So it's also a good experiment which uh, confirm uh, availability of our our setup. And in conclusion, uh, sensor of ultra-local temperature field based on fluorescence nanodiamond has been developed for application in biomedicine, biology, and microelectronics. Yeah, we, uh, unfortunately, we didn't apply for microelectronics, but this is also a perspective direction for application. And uh, finally, this is a mem member of uh, uh, my laboratory, and. Uh, uh, this work has been done under uh, leadership of academician Vitaly Konov and uh, in cooperation with uh, 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 Vadim Tseip, Irina Popova, Alexander uh, Osipov from uh, Biophysical Institute from Pushida and uh, Professor Alexander Radenovich from EPFL, uh, Switzerland. Thank you for attention. one of the, your slide that you can uh, measure the temperature with the uh, kilo, one kilohertz rate. Yes? Uh, one, this one? Oh. One kilohertz. Uh, this is yeah. the maximal yeah. frequency, with ma maximum yeah, yeah. rate uh, yes, with, yes. with which you can measure okay. your temperature. What is the physical phenomena which limit, limit this rate? And my, uh, this is a special uh, part of my equation. And in general, uh, w uh, is it needed to go further uh, in, in frequency, just to, for example, uh, 100 kilohertz, megahertz, to measure the temperature. And, w and, and if yes, uh, what's, what the physical phenomena we are uh, uh, planning to, to see with such high rates? Okay? Yes, yes. I understand. And uh, 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 one kilohertz is limited by uh, a spectroscopic uh, device. Because we are recording temperature uh, uh, for, for some time, which allow us this device. But uh, uh, you, you, you saw that I show uh, accuracy depend on uh, square roots from uh, gears. So uh, actually, from this frequency, if you uh, make shorter uh, uh, time uh, measurement, uh, so you. Uh, you, uh, your accru your accru uh, accuracy of measurements uh, becomes uh, worse, uh, no, no, not so not so precise. But uh, for uh, measurements of uh <coughs> for uh, uh, another uh, another uh, question is good uh, concerning to heater pulse heater. Uh, we can. Uh, uh, increase uh, this pulse, uh, uh, decrease the duration of this pulse till uh, uh, t t 10 microseconds. So this is uh, for small volume. Uh, Prigozhin show in his famous book shows that uh, this uh, for this uh, time uh, in small volume about one micrometer of water. Uh, equilibrium uh, of temperature is uh, released, and we we obtain uh, correct results when 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 we uh, work at uh, uh, that scale of uh, 10, 10 microsecond. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question so, about the calibration. So you said that in, uh, with your nano, uh, nano diamond, so when you, we use laser, then we can heat it up. In the photoluminescence, when we detect the temperature, we also heat it up by laser. How no, no, can no, we No, no, for no. Uh, I uh, try to distinguish that uh, if we uh, use uh, uh, about uh, 100 uh, microwatt of laser power, 
we don't uh, don't hit uh, our nano diamond at all, uh, a, a, any diamond. But if we uh, increase uh, uh, our power, it's very, very more easy to. They can control it by shift of Raman line. No, Is it no, heated no, no, or not? No, no. Uh, 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 just I show you. You you see, uh, this is uh, uh, heating starts from uh, one uh, about one micro uh, microwatt, yeah. but uh, uh, for me temperature measurements we low we go d uh, down uh, in in power. Uh, we use uh, 50 or 100 microwatt. At this at this power we don't heat our nano diamond. Okay. How we know? Yes. But <laughs> we, we, but this is the main principle. You, you, you uh, can oh, discuss oh, oh. it uh, <laughs> we, later. We, we yeah. see the same position. Uh, we determine temperature on position of uh, luminescent line. If position doesn't change, it means that uh, temperature doesn't change. Okay. Understand? So yeah. if there are no other questions, uh, we have uh, to, to, one, to press it. Sorry. Thank you once. And, and the last question. Uh, thank you. A uh, question about um, calibration again. Uh, as I understood, you should calibrate each example of nano diamonds. Yes, but. Uh, what change between uh, examples of nano diamonds and. Uh, uh, is a change if we um, change orientation of non diamonds in your tip manipulator? No, no, it's uh, orientation is the, doesn't influence, but uh, uh, <coughs> quality could be different. Uh, ju ju just for safe, we calibrate. Uh, no, normally, many particles uh, more or less coincide to each other, but uh, sometimes if uh, some graphite uh, 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 fabricated during synthesis, we, we can exclude these uh, particles. So uh, th we do this just for safe, uh, to, be to guarantee that uh, we really uh, working with uh, diamond, which we uh, know, know uh, uh, spectral, uh, spectral characteristic. Uh, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and uh, today we have an unusual presentation during our uh, plenary sessions. Now we have a representation from our industrial partner who supported our conference and that will be the first uh, example how industry, I, what is interested for industry, what are the questions and so I hope it will be a good start. And uh, it, the presentation will be given by uh, Dr. Nalivaika. Yes. Uh, good day. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, speak uh, Russian and, uh, excuse me, okay. Пожалуйста, включите, пожалуйста, презентацию мою. Smart Squan Telecom. Я начну. Я работаю в компании Smart Squan Telecom. Компания занимается разработкой и внедрением оборудования квантового распределения ключей. И, наверное, мой рассказ – это не про науку, а про то, как наука позволяет успешно внедрять. Это не та презентация. Успешно внедрять научные разработки и как эти разработки меняют, ну, собственно, нашу жизнь. Это не то. Ну, я начну без презентации, поскольку ну, не важно. Буду так показывать. Итак, как я сказал, наша компания занимается разработкой. Да, я молодому человеку отдавал. Да, вот.
О, отлично. Да. И, ну, собственно, начнем. Итак, технология квантовой коммуникации, она признана для того, чтобы защищать данные, передаваемые при передаче. В данный момент существует два основных способа защиты данных. Это шифрование с помощью симметричного ключа и криптография с открытым асимметричным ключом. И до недавнего времени там, основные угрозы были связаны с, ну, по сути дела, вычислительными мощностями, которые могут быть направлены на дешифровку защищаемой информации. Тем не менее, в последнее время, благодаря тому, что квантовые вычисления становятся все большей реальностью, мы имеем ситуацию, когда шифрование с открытым ключом, которое используется ну, достаточно массово, может стать ну, просто недостаточным. И здесь для повышения защиты информации как раз и может служить технология с квантовым распределением ключа. Технология квантового распределения ключа позволяет с помощью квантовых однофотонных посылок между отправителями формировать ключевую последовательность, которая в дальнейшем передается в традиционные средства криптографической защиты информации. И тем самым, благодаря высокой, смене, высокой скорости смены ключа, снижению нагрузки на один ключ, мы можем достигать стойкость передаваемой информации, достаточной для того, чтобы не быть взломанной даже с помощью квантового компьютера. И когда в условиях постквантовой криптографии мы можем сравнить изменение стойкости защиты информации, мы видим, что даже технологии программных методов защиты информации с помощью постквантовых алгоритмов, тем не менее, имеют тенденцию к снижению стойкости в части стойкости, которая применяется, в части методов, которые применяются сейчас, стойкость может в одной части исчезнуть с защищаемой информации, то защита информации с помощью технологии квантового распределения ключа, она благодаря физическим принципам и защите на физических принципах позволяет сохранять в течение ну, практически постоянного времени. Технология, которую разрабатываются в нашей кооперации, была создана достаточно давно профессором Юрием Тихоновичем Тарасовичем Мазуренко. Это технология формирования квазиатнофотонных посылок на боковых частотах модулированного излучения. Эта технология, благодаря наличию центральной частоты и модулированию, позволяет передавать однофотонные посылки на большие дальности и благодаря этому иметь более высокие скорости распределения ключа. Ну, что, собственно, происходит при распределении ключа? Мы в нашем оборудовании формируем импульсы, кодируем фазу. После того, как получаем в модуле приема квазинофотонный сигнал, в случае угадывания состояния по открытому каналу обмениваемся информацией, при, после чего мы проверяем качество канала путем выборочного измерения дошедших импульсов. В том случае, если показатели качества канала достаточны для нашей, нашей заданной стойкости, мы корректируем ошибки, усиливаем ключ и передаем этот ключ для дальнейшего использования в средства криптографической защиты информации. На этом слайде показан пример такой текущей стандартной схемы организации квантового распределения ключей для построения линейных сетей. То есть мы видим нижний уровень, это пары модулей КРК 
Алиса и Баба, между которыми происходит, собственно, истинно квантовое распределение ключа, после чего ключ передается в так называемые СКЗ-распределители, где происходит шифрование ну, в идеале один к одному квантово защищенного ключа от одного распределения к другому и уже на концах квантовой сети эти ключи переходят в СКЗ и потребитель. СКЗ и потребитель собственно, занимается шифрованием пользовательской информации. Благодаря вот такой технологии построения квантовых сетей мы имеем возможность иметь скорость распределения равную ну, минимальной скорости распределения между промежуточными узлами, которые находятся в сети. Ну, теперь немножко о том, что у нас получилось. Значит, компания, как я сказал, работает достаточно давно. База, откуда черпаются научные знания и решения, это университет ИТМО. В 2014 году на базе лабораторных образцов в ИТМО была запущена сеть, и мы показали квантовое распределение ключей между корпусами университета на инфраструктуре телекоммуникационного оператора. В 2019 году, благодаря созданию лидирующего инновационного центра национальной квантовой организации, интернета в ИТМО. Мы приняли участие в реализации дорожной карты по квантовым коммуникациям. И первое оборудование, скажем так, промышленного образца было поставлено на сеть РЖД. И на этом оборудовании была запущена первая магистральная квантовая сеть, ну, такая настоящая между Санкт-Петербургом и Москвой. В этом году мы завершили совместно с РЖД запуск квантовой сети между Москвой и Нижним Новгородом. Достаточно большой период прошел между 2020-2021 годом запуска и 2023. В течение этого времени шла тестовая эксплуатация вот этой квантовой сети. И поверьте, мы в течение этого времени провели ну, достаточно много очень серьезных модернизаций оборудования, потому что, как оказалось, эффекты реальной эксплуатации и нахождения в реальных совершенно условиях, еще в очень тяжелых условиях на станциях РЖД, полустанках РЖД, я не побоюсь этого слова сказать, много разных эффектов, начиная от влияния движения электропоездов, температура, влажность, вибрации, все это было невозможно можно предугадать в лабораторных условиях, и модернизация оборудования не завершена до настоящего времени. Значит, вот здесь на картинке просто показаны реальные образцы. Внизу наша система квантового распределения ключей, которая работает совместно с СКЗ производства Амикон. По регуляторике ФСБ, собственно, каждая каркас-система должна работать с совершенно определенным СКЗ, и именно такие пары они подлежат сертификации. У нас есть решение, когда СКЗ и система квантового распределения ключей находятся в одном корпусе. Здесь мы применяем шифратор, который работает по технологии L1. Данная система она хороша для работы по передаче защиты данных между цодами, когда требуется низкая лантензия и высокая скорость передачи данных. По задаче из Минпромторга мы попытались перевести элементную базу системы квантовых ключей в, с применением отечественных компонентной базы. И вот с 2019 по 2022 год, это период, когда длился этот окр, нам удалось импортозаместить порядка 65% элементов в системе. Это хороший задел для развития вот этого направления в применении этих систем для защиты информации, имеющей грифы секретные и более высокие грифы, поскольку там применение именно отечественной абонентной, элементной базы является критичным. 
Ну и благодаря развитию собственно, оборудования мы были вынуждены формировать разработки собственных компонентов в наших системах. Здесь показан детектор одиночных фотонов. Это полностью разработка с Марского антилеком совместно с университетом ИТМО. Полностью все сделано из отечественной элементной базы, ну, за, за исключением микроэлектроники и, к сожалению, ключевого элемента лавинного фотодиода. Фотодиод корейский здесь, но мы работаем, у нас есть совместная работа с ОКБ планеты по созданию отечественного фотодиода. И мы находимся, то, что называется, на пути к успеху, чтобы этот фотодиод имел характеристики, достаточные для применения в системах квантового распределения ключей. Второй элемент, который у нас хорошо получился, это электронно-оптический модулятор фазовый и амплитудный в каждой системе включает в себя, в себя три фазовых один амплитудный модулятор это устройство мы сделали совместно с физико-техническим институтом и офис Санкт-Петербурга и могу сказать что характеристики данного изделия но они ничем не хуже чем аналогичных изделий производите Yellow Space или лучше Китай образцов. Кроме того, в компании, благодаря нашей кооперации с научной средой, идет работа по новым заделам. В частности, мы отрабатываем протокол с распределением ключей с непрерывными переменными. Ну, это должно позволить существенно уменьшить размеры квантового распределения ключей и повысить скорость для небольших расстояний. По запросу от операторов телекоммуникаций, которых мы предполагаем будут активно применять системы, идет реализация МНИРа, и мы сейчас переходим в стадию ОХА, то есть подготовки уже образца для сертификации по распределению квантового ключа в одном волокне вместе с информационным каналом. В решении будет перенесено на частотный диапазон в 1300 нанометров квантовое распределение, а телекоммуникационный диапазон 1550 нанометров останется для передачи информации. Ну и, конечно, квантовое распределение ключей по атмосферному каналу. Здесь достаточно серьезный запрос от транспортников, которые развивают беспилотные системы, как железнодорожные, автомобильные и летательные. К сожалению, наша система достаточно громоздка пока что, но я надеюсь, что в ближайшие там, несколько лет она существенно потеряет в размере и весе и будет пригодна для применения в существующих транспортных системах. Одной из важных задач является формирование то, что называется клиентского абонентского модуля, значит, который можно было бы устанавливать просто на рабочем столе, и который был, имел бы очень низкую там, стоимость. К сожалению, такие системы пока что строятся с временным разделением, то есть в, в центре модуль получателя с детектором одиночных фотонов, а оптимизация в стоимости идет, идет за счет удешевления АЛИС. Целевые значения по стоимости – это чтобы центральный узел стоил там, порядка 5-10 миллионов рублей и абонентский модуль до миллиона рублей. Но это позволит привести в ситуацию, когда Системы будут сравнимы по стоимости с традиционными СКЗИ, применяемыми для передачи данных, но, правда, для высоких скоростей. Здесь на слайде вот типовой узел квантовой сети в РЖД. Он построен с применением всех необходимых атрибутов, сопровождающих передачу защищенной информации и квантораспределения ключей, а также отвечающие требованиям стек для размещения и использования средств криптографической защиты информации. 
Ну, здесь немножко говорится о квантовых сетях, которые в данный момент существуют. Это Санкт-Петербург, Москва, Москва, Нижний Новгород. В этом году планируется достройка до Казани и Южная ветка до Сочи. Кроме того, мы ведем достаточно большую работу с различными телеком-операторами, тестируем, пробуем продукты, пытаемся билинговать, поднимать, как потенциальные заказчики будут применять наши системы. И вот в том числе с Ростелеком в этом году провели испытания на их новой сети T-Next. Сеть предназначена для трансконтинентальной передачи данных. Имеют кабели с волокнами с низкой с низким затуханием, и, в общем, эксперимент показал, что они очень хорошо пригодны для передачи квантового ключа для, на большие расстояния. Ищем потребителей, в том числе в силовых структурах, на форуме армии совместно с Главным управлением вооруженных сил показали работу трехузловой квантовой сети между стендами ГУСа и нашим и нашего партнера. Готовы сотрудничать, взаимодействовать с любыми потенциальными заказчиками, партнерами в части организации демонстрации технологии и пользы, которые можно получить благодаря ее применению. Технологии демонстрации у нас уже отработаны и будет, может быть легко воспроизведена. Ну, это тоже так сказать, примерная схема организации связи для передачи защищенных данных с защитой с помощью квантового распределения ключей. Могу сказать, что технология сложная, и ее внедрение она требует достаточно серьезных ресурсов, особенно в части доработки оборудования с учетом реальных условий применения и учетов требований регуляторов ФСБ в части стойкости и защищенности оборудования. И без поддержки государства ну, как бы эта технология, к сожалению, ну, взлететь не сможет. И э, в 2019 году была э, утверждена дорожная карта по развитию э, технологии э, квантовой коммуникации. Именно в рамках этой дорожной карты, по сути дела, ведутся все э, научные и опно-консалтерские разработки, э, и идет применение э, и внедрение этих сетей. И вот на июльском форуме, который был буквально два месяца назад, э, Владимир Владимирович смотрел результаты, и гендиректор нашей компании Алексей вместе с э, Белозеровым Олегом Валентиновичем, это руководитель РЖД, показывали Владимиру Владимировичу результаты нашей работы. Кроме того, технология требует достаточно большой работы в части формирования стандартов, поскольку и в России, и в мире существует достаточно уже много центров разработки и внедрения технологии. В России работают с этими задачами технические комитеты 26 и 194, как раз которые занимаются системами криптографической защиты информации и киберфизическими системами, а также ведущие мировые структуры по стандартизации. Безусловно, развитие технологии, формирование стандартов и ее применение невозможно без взаимодействие с нашим регулятором, который эту область регулирует от ФСБ России. Ну и, наверное, следующий самый главный слайд в этой презентации. В компании создана среда по, от науки до внедрение. То есть у нас есть подразделения, которые занимаются и фундаментальной наукой, это в университете ИТМО, и теоретическим обоснованием тех или иных 
протоколов и решений, а также серьезная группа, которая занимается, собственно, R&D, разработкой и оборудования, и дальнейшее внедрение и сопровождение, что уже самое главное. Но, тем не менее, компания накопила достаточно серьезный большой опыт, и мы видим, что, собственно, наших ресурсов, которые вот есть в городе Санкт-Петербурге, явно недостаточно для решения всех задач, которые есть в в развитии этой технологии. Поэтому мы приглашаем уважаемое сообщество научное для сотрудничества, причем компания может выступать как заказчиком, инвестором, индустриальным партнером. Нас интересуют любые решения, как в части формирования элементной базы, системы управления фотонными сигналами, создания новых протоколов, доказательств, так и формирование ну, говоря, финального продукта, разработки конечных изделий. Благодарю за внимание. Да, пожалуйста. Будьте добры. Ну, во-первых, спасибо за доклад. И есть ли у вас оценка, как улучшается вероятность несанкционированного декодирования при использовании обычных средств передачи информации и при использовании вашего аппарата? Спасибо. Да, такие оценки, безусловно, мы делаем, и в первую очередь стойкость информации, защищенной информации с помощью нашей технологии, она достигается благодаря высокой частоте смены ключа. То, что недостижимо в там, реальной жизни. Теперь о том, как растет стойкость. Ну, стойкость растет, ну, насколько я понимаю, в больше, чем в экспоненту, в зависимости от оценки вероятности. Да, оценки При вероятности. прочих равных условиях. При прочих равных условиях там, растет значительно и становится там, ну, недостижимой для взлома. Более детально, если хотите, давайте мы поговорим в кварах. В вашем докладе вы показывали электрооптические модуляторы отечественного производства да. с частотой до 10 ГГц. Да. На каком физическом принципе они работают? И собираетесь ли вы, э, думаете ли вы о производстве более высокочастотных модуляторов за границей до 100 ГГц более продемонстрированным? Mm -hmm. Да, я отвечу. Значит, смотрите, мы в наших модуляторах используем чипы из небатолития, которые для нас готовят лаборатория Фистеха Санкт-Петербургского. Частота ограничена. Модуляторы работают реально до 20 ГГц, но наши системы работают на частоте порядка 4,85 ну, ГГц, поэтому для нас потолка в 10 ГГц достаточно. Значит, у нас, по сути дела, разработка финальная, то есть мы не занимаемся физическим принципом и, собственно, самим чипом. По сути дела, мы чип там обрамляем, доводим его до применения. Если у нас появится задача выйти с более высокой частотой, мы будем об этом думать. Ну, пока что задача была решить вопрос наличия модуляторов. Сейчас модуляторы за границей трудно купить для наших систем. Спасибо. Фундаментальных проблем квантовой связи – это затухание сигнала. Какая вот сейчас ситуация и перспективы с квантовыми репитерами? И... Да, значит, системы, которые мы разрабатываем, дают распределение ключа со скоростью сотни бит в секунду при затуханиях порядка 20 дБ. То есть для стандартных оптических волоконных трасс операторов это расстояние порядка 100-120 километров. Для вот трасс Ростелекома, которые я показывал, где затухание низкое в каналах, высокая прозрачность волокна, там это будет 150. Это для холодильников, ну, для детекторов одиночных фотографов, которые работают на 
ну, высокотемпературных, которые работают в режимах порядка минус 60 градусов. Если мы говорим о детекторов, работающих на сверхпроводимости, то есть ну, около нуля кельвин, то там они работают до 45 дБ, то есть порядка 250. По квантовым репитерам, по квантовой памяти компания сотрудничает с Казанским квантовым центром Сергеем Андреевичем Моисеевым. В рамках наших задач есть определенные заделы, есть патенты, связанные с подготовкой протокола взаимодействия систем квантового распределения ключей и квантовой памяти, которые вот разрабатываются в их центре. Мы, мы очень надеемся, что вопрос квантовой, квантовой памяти и квантового репитера, который можно применять для квантов, именно квантового распределения ключей, ну, он будет решаться, потому что сейчас стоимость доверенного узла, она, к сожалению, очень высока. Спасибо. Простите, я позволю себе тоже вопрос задать. А вот что касается источников фотонов, здесь проблемы какие-то есть? И вы вообще интересуетесь этим вопросом? Потому что у нас есть и доклады, и предыдущий доклад касался этой темы тоже когда мы говорим об источниках фотонов для нас крайне важно это не только ну, собственно что это был одиночный фотон а очень важная характеристика Конечно, является его да. чистота стабильность и управляемость параметрами то есть фазы или там да, да. поляризации соответственно ну, в наших системах мы используем не источник одиночных фотонов а мы используем лазер который ну, говоря, модулируем по фазе и потом нарезаем на амплитудном модулятор а потом просто доводим Нет, ну, до квази -однофотонного. Решена проблема вообще? Вот э, в, в квази однофотонном плане она ну, решена. А, но хотелось бы, конечно, иметь истинные фотоны, управляемые и с ранее понятным состоянием. Да. Ладно, спасибо большое. Очень интересно. Еще, еще. Хотелось бы отметить, что для нас это совсем новая тематика, но обращаю ваше внимание, что с завтрашнего дня будет работать секция по квантовым технологиям. Это впервые у нас на конференции такая секция, поэтому какие-то вопросы мы вообще никогда не рассматривали. Так сказать. Вот сейчас сегодня впервые они поднимаются, может быть в будущем мы будем лучше понимать то, о чем нам говорили. Вот, спа вас, да. Спасибо большое. Да, и, так, сказать, так, теперь у нас объявление. Коллег, some information from program committee. First, today room number four is in another auditorium. You will find uh, the way. Uh, it's the same way, but not uh, upstairs, but downstairs. You will, you will see error there, so you'll find it definitely. Uh, сегодня четвертая комната у нас переехала. Значит, это вот как вы шли раньше наверх по лестнице, так теперь вниз. Ну, там стрелочки нарисованы, вы легко их найдете. Second, tomorrow uh, we will have boat trip. Don't forget, please. We will start from here at 15. Please be in time. Завтра в 3 часа мы стартуем отсюда на теплоходную прогулку. And uh, last but not least, uh, for session which will be working here, Uh, today we will have a person who is responsible for technical support. You can ask for help with presentations. For, uh, yes, and post a session to be begun today. Yes. Yes. Today, the uh, post session will begin at 17. Uh, and the post session will begin at 17. You will see it just, just uh, behind the Uh, registration point. You will see it definitely. Okay. Thank you. Спасибо. Переходим в секции.
terus Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, let me uh, proceed to our today's session. And the first presentation is uh, properties of terahertz holographic axicon fabricated by laser ablation of a black diamond by Dr. Maxim Kamalonek from General Physics Institute. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank organizing committee for the invitation to to speak here. So I will talk about our work, which was done uh, in co cooperation with Samaru University and uh, 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 Novosibirsk. Um, the name of my talk is Properties of Terahertz Holographic Oxycon Fabricated by Laser Ablation of a Black Diamond. So first, uh, let me briefly uh, describe the problems. So traditional uh, for terahertz optics used different polymers and lenses, and they are produced by milling or turning of polymers. And the problem is that it, uh, they are not so stable for high power with the sources, for, for example, Novofel, free electron laser, and so it has very power irradiation in terahertz range. And so uh, we need to use another material, for example, silicon or even diamond, which has high thermal conductivity, but the problem is to process them. So. Uh, so we propose to use diffractive optics, and so uh, traditionally uh, reactive ion etching uh, used for silicon etching, and so you can produce binary diffractive elements, but they have very low efficiency, and so there is problem to produce multi-level shape. So. Uh, we propose to use laser ablation for processing silicon, and so we use uh, high repetition laser with picosecond pulse duration and high repetition rate. And so we move the beam with Galvana scanner and we put uh, the sample on the linear stage. So here you can see our first element on silicon. So it's four-level 
silicon funnel lens and uh, on the bottom you, you can see the testing of this element on in Novosibirsk in Novofell and uh, we see uh, intensity distribution at different distances and so the focus was about 120 millimeter as, as, as we plan and uh, but you see the diffraction efficiency is very low this element so first of all beco uh, because of uh, uh, binary uh, binary uh, not binary but uh, f because of uh, four uh, steps no it's not a continuous relief and so we have uh, losses uh, and another problem that silicon is uh, has uh, high refractive index and we have very high reflection loss so even half of uh, energy we lose for for the reflection so after that we uh, try to improve the quality so we we uh, produce piecewise continuous profile on the silicon and here you can see the uh, diffractive element which focus Gaussian beam into square region and so uh, so it has the profile you can see on the, on the bottom of, of the slide uh, and energy distribution is on the right side and we see that we can very we have we have very good uh, focusing of our Gaussian beam into the square region but and we achieve very high diffraction efficiency but uh, uh, still we have no we have uh, a lot of reflection losses so the best way used to to use uh, diamond optics in this case we uh, have lower refractive index so we have in this case we will have only 30 percent for reflections and and also diamond has very high thermal re thermal conductivity so it's the best uh, element for high power terahertz optics but uh, the the problem uh, the problem is that uh, diamond difficult to process because uh, it uh, it's um, it has good transmittance in visible and infrared range so and yesterday professor waker told us about the problems with uh, ablation of any transparent material with uh, modern infrared lasers and they propose to to use uh, plasma to induced uh, absorption of laser radiation in the uh, transparent material and so uh, so what's the problem so uh, here you can see our not good uh, elements so we try to do direct directly on the diamond uh, the lens but we see the transmittance is very low and the problem is uh, that uh, we have uh, filmentation in in uh, in the bulk of the diamond and uh, we use uh, the focal uh, the um, focusing of our uh, lens was 100 millimeter and the relay length is more than the thickness of our sample and it uh, absorbs uh, the energy also in the bulk so we not so we structure not only the surface but also the bulk and we have a uh, lot of cracks uh, on the surface and uh, so it's uh, it's bad way to to uh, process 
So in, uh, we uh, propose to use inverted pattern on a silicon substrate, and, and after that we so we first need to pattern the silicon, and then we can uh, use it as a substrate for for the synthesis of the diamond. So briefly, uh, you can see this technique on this slide. So first we structure the surface of silicon and then grow the diamond. And after that, we have uh, the diamond, inverted diamond lens. Uh, so we did it and here you can see the diamond diffractive lens with a piecewise continuous profile. So uh, we, you, you can see this silicon template and diamond lens which uh, very good, so, so have smooth surface and it's really replicate uh, the uh, silicon substrate. And we measure the diffraction efficiency of our element was close to 100%. And so low reflection losses, but uh, the problem is that uh, it's not so cheap that, uh, that we have, uh, here you can see the diamond of very good optical quality and we need about uh, 5,000 hours to, for synthesis of this diamond element. So it's uh, about one month to, to obtain uh, such an element. So, and uh, here you can see the uh, testing of of this lens also. Uh, so it was very good cylindrical lens. So f focusing about focal lens of 14 millimeters. And so the idea to use not uh, so good diamond for optics is it's uh, called black diamond, so it's not transparent in visible and infrared range, but it's transparent in terahertz region. So this is what, what we need. Um, so another advantage of black diamond, it's really cheap and uh, because, first of all, because of very high growth rate. And previously this um, uh, diamond, uh, these diamonds never uh, used for optics. It's, f it's just me mechanical grade, so not, f not for optics. But uh, you see that in terahertz range, is this diamond is transparent. So uh, we compare the ablation of black and so called white diamond. So it's the same uh, curve. And uh, why uh, this black diamond is black? So the main uh, feature is that scattering, that it has a lot of uh, boundaries between crystallites and uh, uh, it has a uh, big scattering. So it's really uh, um, uh, the same quality, uh, but uh, in just in ma macro scale. So uh, you see that uh, um, red region is uh, the depth of uh, uh, the track after the lazy radiation. So we don't ha have uh, big fermentation here. So it's uh, uh, because of reflect uh, uh, reflective uh, be because of reflectance of the beam, and so we can very good ablate and produce. Uh, directly uh, the uh, structure what we need on the surface. So uh, here you can see the modeling and uh, experiment of holographic axicon. So the aperture was 20 millimeters, uh, topological charge nine, so it means we have nine segments uh, uh, um, and uh, you, uh, on, on the right side you, see, you can see the intensity distribution of 
uh, of the uh, modeling and experiment. So we obtain a uh, good Bessel beam from Gaussian beam, and when we focus it uh, with the lens with focus uh, 100 millimeter, we obtain uh, so-called perfect beams, which has uh, ring, ring shape, uh, so it's very high quality. You can see a good agreement be between theory and experiment. And so, so you can see here the same image. So we have very smooth surface uh, of, of, of this sample. And also we compare uh, binar uh, binary silicon, oxycon, and holographic oxycon. And you can see on, on the top uh, the intensity distribution, uh, cross-section of intensity distribution on, on different uh, lengths after the element on the top for holographic oxycon and on the bottom for binary oxycon. And you see uh, that in case of holographic oxycon we have very good uh, ring shape without any losses and if we use uh, binary silicon uh, oxycon we will have uh, losses uh, not, not so ideal shape of ring and the theory also told us that it shouldn't be very good ring and so it's uh, we demonstrate that we can do very good holographic oxycons on the diamond and here are my conclusions so thank you for your attention thank you for the interesting presentation uh, we have some times for questions thank you this is very inspiring uh, inspiring um, uh, can you tell me uh, why don't you use femtosecond ablation? You stick to, same, to pick a second. It has the same problem with femtoseconds, so it doesn't matter. If we try to use uh, tw 20, 400 femtosecond laser, we, we, ha we have the same sources. But in this case, you also will have uh, a filamentation in, in the bulk when you, when we, when you use uh, uh, big uh, focal lens and so and infrared uh, wavelengths right, Be because of multi multi yeah, so uh, and, and uh, using two pulses one for heating a second for ablation uh, you, 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 you need to use uh, ultraviolet uh, wavelengths otherwise uh, diamond is transparent so you need a multi-photonic ionization to induce absorption in diamond, I, even uh, not only in diamond, in, in a, yeah. a, 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 any transparent material. So the one way, so a uh, couple of years ago, uh, when we uh, made, uh, our laboratory made uh, diffractive element for infrared region, we used excimer laser. But the productivity of, of this laser is not so high. You very low repetition rate. And uh, for uh, terahertz source, you need the depth about 100 micron and aperture about uh, 20 or better 30, 50 millimeters. So you cannot uh, ablate with such uh, uh, low repetition rate laser. All right, Maybe thank you. Thank you. Yeah. To shorter pulses, the damage is even worse because multi photon ionization is stronger. So, pick a second is better than 50 second in this case. In this case, I you will, uh, will have not enough power, so I mean, energy pulse energy to ablate diamond. So, it's because it's uh, ha has uh, very high damage threshold. Maxim, finally, I don't understand. Finally, are you satisfied with yeah. your 
this black diamond, yes. <laughs> yeah, so you need no more other decisions. <laughs> or or okay. you have some problems. Uh, That's the so, uh, yes, I understand. So uh, now we think about uh, anti-reflection uh, coating, not coating, but structures. So Structure. we we, oh, yeah. we we we, okay. th we think about combining this relief with yeah. to to, uh, to, to, to increase okay. uh, to to diminish losses. Yeah, yeah, to diminish uh, reflection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a laser technology which was especially developed for nano and microstructuring of hard transparent materials like diamonds and sapphire and so on. This is called laser induced backside wet etching. Have you tried this technology? Uh, no. But uh, I think that uh, it will be so. Um, when when you will uh, use the back backward uh, ablation, so the problem will be that uh, you will uh, you will have structure on on the back side, and you will uh, um, spoil your beam after the prop after the propagation through it. So if, if you need to, to uh, li li like Professor Waker yesterday told us, if you use uh, the backward ablation, so uh, the main limitation is that you can, cannot obtain uh, big depths, cannot obtain, uh, um, um, how can I say, so this, uh, this uh, relief you cannot obtain. Okay. Oh, is it's, it can be used only for uh, small structures, surface structuring, which uh, does not uh, spoil your beam, which you need to 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 ablate. So, if you if you make a structure on the backside, you will uh, shift your beam. You could not uh, precise ablate uh, uh, on, on big depths. Okay, it can be discussed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now I invite Ashikaliyeva Kuravai from General Physics Institute to give a talk. Uh, dear colleagues, I would like to present some recent, uh, recent results of uh, obtained by our a research group uh, in the field of laser synthesis of nanostructures from liquid media. Uh, for convenience, my uh, report is divided into two parts. And uh, uh, first, I'm going to speak about uh, uh, laser synthesis of gold nanostructures. Uh, <coughs> it is known that laser radiation induces a number of photochemical reactions in gold salt solutions yielding gold nanoparticles. Although this uh, subject is intensely studied, many underlying physical mechanisms uh, remain poorly understood. Uh, the goal of our study was to synthesize gold nanostructures and to by femtosecond laser pulses and to study their stability. We prepared uh, aqueous solutions of a gold salt and then irradiated them by femtosecond uh, pulses uh, at different uh, pulse energies. 
After radiation, the solutions uh, were examined using transmission electron microscopy and optical spectroscopy. Uh, this slide shows the results of uh, laser, uh, laser radiation uh, at low pulse energies. And we found that the threshold for gold nanoparticle formation is uh, a, pulse na a pulse energy 50 microjoules. And uh, uh, as we can see from the figure, uh, there are a spectra of a gold ion solution before and after irradiation at a pulse energy 100 micro, uh, microjoules. And uh, we see that the spectra uh, have two absorption peaks. The first one is uh, in the UV range. Uh, this peak is uh, related to the presence of gold ions in the solution. And the second uh, absorption peak is uh, about uh, 550 nanometers. And uh, this uh, peak is determined by plasmon absorption of gold nanoparticles. And uh, the amplitude of this peak is proportional to the concentration of the gold nanoparticles. And uh, we found that at higher uh, laser pulses, the concentration of gold uh, nanoparticles synthesized uh, uh, becomes several times higher. Uh, also, we found that all uh, gold nanoparticles uh, formed at low pulse energies are very stable. They don't aggregate during uh, many months. At the highest energy used, uh, namely at 800 microjoules, uh, we, uh, we see an entirely different picture, namely uh, the absorption uh, peak in the UV range disappears, uh, which means that all gold ions are reduced uh, during, uh, because of photochemical reactions. Uh, and we, uh, we have only one plasmonic uh, peak. Uh, and uh, interestingly that the day after irradiation, a new additional plasmonic peak appears. And uh, whereas the first peak, uh, the amplitude of first peak uh, decreases. And, uh, Mm, this, this new peak is attributed uh, to the longitudinal plasmonic uh, absorption of the elongated particles. Uh, uh, what this means? It means that uh, laser radiation uh, uh, synthesized uh, after, uh, under laser radiation, uh, gold particles are synthesized, and after radiation, these gold particles uh, tend to uh, form gold uh, nanochains and uh, apparently that laser irradiation uh, somehow activates the surface properties of the gold nanoparticles. That is why they tend to uh, cluster in gold chains. And uh, it should be noted that uh, these gold chains are not stable. They uh, aggregate uh, and precipitate, precipitate uh, during several weeks. And uh, here we can see the morphology of the synthesized gold nanoparticles uh, at uh, low pulse energies. Uh, gold nanoparticles has triangle, round, and uh, faceted shape, shapes, uh, uh, while at high pulse energies, uh, gold nanochains with a specific dendrite uh, structure are formed and such gold nanochains uh, tend to rearrange in aggregates. Second part of my talk uh, deals with uh, linear carbon chains. Uh, laser radiation of carbon containing liquids is known to result in the formation of uh, linear carbon chains. Uh, uh, carbon chains uh, 
uh, can uh, may reach the length of carbon chains may reach 40 atoms. And there are two problems with uh, linear carbon chains. The first one is uh, their low stability, they tend to aggregate. And the second one, uh, uh, the formation of uh, laser induced byproducts, which have to be separated from the li uh, linear carbon uh, chains. Uh, the goal of our study was to synthesize uh, uh, linear carbon chains and to by picosecond laser radiation and to study uh, their stability. Uh, we prepared suspensions by adding uh, graphite microflakes into ethanol. Then uh, we uh, irradiated resultant suspensions by uh, femtosecond uh, picosecond laser pulses in, in the infrared range, varying the pulse number or the pulse energy. And after radiation, the samples were examined by means of transmission electron microscopy and optical spectroscopy. And uh, we found that all irradiated suspensions uh, contains different carbon uh, structures. Uh, for example, unmodified graphite microflakes, uh, carbon nanospheres and carbon uh, multi-volt uh, nanotubes. Unfortunately, uh, linear, linear carbon chains uh, were too small to be detected by transmission electron microscopy, uh, but they can be easily detected by optical spectroscopy because they absorb in uh, the ultraviolet range. Indeed, we found that after irradiation, uh, uh, carbon chains of different length were uh, formed in the suspensions and uh, chain length varied from 6 to 16 atoms. And um, as we can see from the figure, the absorption intensity of the uh, chains uh, is proportional, uh, is uh, grows with increasing uh, uh, pulse energy. And this dependence is close to the uh, linear. Uh, moreover, we can see that, uh, that uh, there is an additional absorption background in the UV range, and we believe that this background is connected, uh, is related to the uh, ultra small uh, byproducts of laser radiation. According to now to our estimations, uh, the uh, absorption intensity of these byproducts also uh, grows with increasing pulse, pulse energy. And then we varied, varied uh, the number of uh, laser pulses, and we found that practically the same set of uh, carbon chains uh, were obtained, was obtained in the suspensions. And uh, similarly, the carbon chains and the uh, laser-induced byproducts, uh, their concentration uh, grows with increasing the number of laser pulses. And uh, we study uh, stability of irradiated suspensions and as we can see from the figure uh, the total absorption intensity of suspensions uh, decreases within 12 days. Uh, this means that big particles uh, during uh, precipitate uh, rapidly during first days after laser radiation. And uh, But we can see that uh, the absorption background uh, remains in the UV range and uh, this means that apparently ultra-small uh, laser-induced uh, byproducts uh, uh, precipitate much more slowly. And interestingly that uh, we found that uh, the intensity uh, the absorption intensity of uh, carbon chains uh, did not change during the period of study. Uh, and uh, we believe that 
uh, the chains uh, are stable in uh, ethanol in the ethanol medium, and they don't uh, they practically uh, don't interact with each uh, with one another with byproducts and uh, with uh, oxidizing agents. Uh, hence, they don't aggregate. And at last, we tried to uh, separate the byproducts from the synthesized uh, carbon chains. And we compared three methods for separation. And uh, first, sedimentation, centrifugation, and filtration. And as we can see, all these methods uh, make it possible to purify the li uh, linear carbon chains from the large products, whereas the ultra-small ones cannot be separated. This, there are my conclusions. Thank you for a nice talk. So now, questions? Hey, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask you, as I understood, uh, you have a laser ablation of a, um, uh, acid of a chlorine. Um, yeah. Uh, for for uh, yes, uh, chlorine chl 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 auric. It's yes. uh, without. It was a without a target, right? Yeah, without target. Without a target. Mm -hmm. So did you investigate the dependence of the concentration of your acid to the size of the particles? Because, mm -hmm. as I understood, you have a, uh, thermal chemical processes mm -hmm. that leads to formation of such particles. As the first question. Mm -hmm. And the second one, uh, let's start for the first question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, we studied uh, the dependence of uh, um, laser synthesis of nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, from the concentration. Uh, but we found that at higher concentrations, uh, uh, the formed, the synthesized gold nanoparticles uh, rapidly precipitate. Precipitate. Mm -hmm. I see. And that is why we don't uh, use such high concentrations. Mm -hmm. And the second question: uh, Do you know the works where the because you told me about the uh, formation of a chains of gold nanoparticles after one two days, and uh, you have never think about that it's um, caused by the uh, the charge on the particles. So for example, uh, I work in a similar area. We did the investigation mm -hmm. when we use a spe uh, especially. Uh, monovalent, bivalent ions we edited in our uh, solutions and uh, under the, uh, because the solutions, for example, uh, chlorine, uh, chloride and so on, uh, they can affect uh, to um, combine these uh, spherical nanoparticles to the chain. They can uh, aggregate like mm -hmm. that. Have you think about it? Uh, yes, we think about it, but uh, we could not, uh, at the present time, we could not uh, say exactly okay. uh, what uh, influence the uh, aggregation of the particles, but we think that uh, laser somehow activates the surface of. Uh, For sure, because you have uh, a chloride uh, in your solution. Yes. Anyway, mm -hmm. we will speak later. Yeah. I uh -huh. will not Thank to you. spend time. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I would like to ask uh, if you investigate uh, the optical density on uh, 400 nanometers for gold spectra, because I heard uh, like there is mm, some works uh, in which uh, they said that uh, the optical spectra on uh, 400 nanometers corresponds to uh, uh, metallic uh, gold concentration, mm -hmm. or in this work you only investigate and peaks of uh, spectra. So, yeah. um, 400 nanometers? Uh, you mean the uh, laser wavelength? No, no, no. 
uh, on a spectra. Mm -hmm. So you have it's, uh, ah. the next slide, I think. Uh, so what optical density uh, on 400 nanometers, mm -hmm. I heard there's works uh, in which as they say this, the value of spectra mm -hmm. on 400 nanometers correspond to uh, concentration of metallic gold in the solution. So in this work you uh, no, didn't investigate it? No, we don't investigate and uh, we uh, studied only two peaks. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Any other questions? So maybe I will ask. Uh, and what do you plan to do with uh, finally with your chains? So you filter them on on what on on which substrate and wha what are the following plans? Um, uh, gold nano chains are very interesting effect which have uh, which we uh, uh, have recently found. But uh, unfortunately, they are not stable. That is why we should uh, uh, look for some stabilizers, maybe, to stabilize them, uh, because they are very, they aggregate very quickly, and that is why uh, they could not be used in uh, practical applications. But uh, I think that they can be very useful because because they have their have developed a surface. Okay. Let's thank you again. So now I invite Shostakov from St. Petersburg University. And the talk laser deposition of electrically conductive structures from a deep rotating solvent on dielectric substrates. So please. Uh, good morning for everyone. Uh, my name is Dmitry Shostakov. I'm a graduate student of physics department at Lity University, St. Petersburg. Uh, the topic of my report is laser deposition of electric conductive structures from a deep eutectic solvent on the electric substrates. Uh, deep eutectic solvent is a mixture of some components that at a certain ratio uh, greatly reduce their melting point. In our case, we use hydrogen chloride and citric acid and copper stat. Where is hydrogen chloride and citric acid is our death, and copper stat is an additive. Uh, <coughs> um, stages of deposition uh, includes a taking the required amount of death, uh, dissolving death with water at a certain proportion, uh, deposition uh, this to the surface using spin quarter and then an, on an iron at the temperature of 80 degrees, laser radiation process and <coughs> cleaning with water and drying with compressed air. Uh, deposition setup includes a source of power radiation, power up to 5 watt, uh, wave flying 1064 nanometer, frequency 80 megahertz, pulse time 7 picosecond. And uh, second, optical mirrors, number three, a polarization plate, number four, reflected radiation absorber, number five, polarization beam splitter, number six, power detector, number seven, Galva scanner system, number eight, uh, sample disk. Uh, video of the radiation process, Um, and this structure um, um, may be RFID text um, <coughs> with uh, electrical resistivity less than uh, 40 ohms and uh, the real time of obtaining this structure is less than 6 minutes. Uh, we can use different substrates such as a flat glass, a curved surface and flexible substrates. Uh, the most studied uh, structures on coatings. So, <coughs> uh, the XRD image shows that um, the film contains copper in metallic stage. A firm profile of the resulting film, uh, the characteristic morphology uh, I, uh, is a two radial peaks and very flat central part. Uh, the same image shows that the surface 
of the coating is highly porous, the pore size is the order on one micrometer. Uh, <coughs> And the spin coat and rotation spin is highly effective on the thickness of the desk coating. With the increase of rotation speed, uh, the thickness of the desk uh, changes from uh, 14 microns to 7 microns. The most conductive structure was obtained uh, with spin coat and rotation speed, 1000 uh, RPM. A low speed is of little use because it doesn't allow for defective free application of desk. Uh, the effect of power density on the uh, morphology of the coating uh, is um, demonstrated in them images. <coughs> the optimal range from uh, 14 to 38 kilowatts per square centimeter, a low power leads to a lack of deposition uh, or highly defective film, a high power leads to ablation of the central part of the track. The dependencies of electrical resistivity uh, of coatings on laser power density can be divided into three zones. In the first zone, electrical resistivity decreases from 100 to 1 ohm square millimeter per meter. <coughs> it's due to the um, increasing the cross section of copper patterns. In the second zone, uh, we obtain the minimal resistivity for all thickness. For example, for 11 microns of depth, the electrical resistivity uh, was the 0.55 ohm square millimeter per meter. In the third zone, <coughs> electrical resistivity grow up rapidly. It's due to the ablation of the central part of the track. <coughs> the effect of different scaling speed on morphology and width of the track is demonstrated in the same images. A significant effect of uh, laser speed uh, is noticeable um, with increasing uh, speed over uh, 30 millimeters per second. However, the lowest electrical resistivity was achieved uh, with speed of 15 millimeters per second. Besides this, the number of passes was optimized. The lowest electrical resistivity was achieved with four passes for all speeds. Uh, for deposition um, solid structure, it's necessary to optimize the deposition density. Deposition density is the distance between two centers of the track. Uh, the optimal shading <coughs> for um, tracks width of 70 microns was 40 microns. Uh, large scale uh, leads to uh, <coughs> um, don't form the continuous structure. Uh, a smaller one uh, leads to ablation that uh, to increase the electrical resistivity. Uh, the main application of this technology is the uh, creation of some conductive structures as, such as a simple electrodes or uh, circuit conductive <coughs> structure uh, on different substrates without the need for masks and photolithography. Uh, this technology is ready for some industrial application. Um, <coughs> uh, we used uh, deposition mode for deposition on curved surface uh, using a long focus lens and um, focusing a laser at 20 microns. It's possible to deposition um, com uh, complex electrical circuits on curved surface without the need to change deposition modes and patterns. So there, is, um, there are uh, the examples of some RFID tags and uh, QR code on curved surface. Uh, we use mode for, for the flat glass to deposit uh, on flexible surface without any changes, but it didn't work in really good, so we decrease the laser power beam in two times, and now we can deposit any pattern on polyamine substrates without any changes. Uh, summary. Uh, we have achieved the following results. The minimum resistivity was 0 0.55 ohm square millimeter per meter. We can use different substrates such as flat glass, flexible and curved surface. The standard piece of our track is 70 microns. There is a can speed more than 10 millimeters per second. And we can deposit any patterns on different substrates without difficult preparation.
uh, thanks for your attention. And I'm really sorry, but I don't have enough listening skills, so I am going to ask you to ask me in Russian. Okay. Вопросы. Электросопротивление ваших медных пленок, как оно соотносится с массивным, с массивной меди? Во сколько раз хуже? Спасибо за вопрос. Дело в том, что о, те данные, которые я вам показал, они на самом деле двухмесячной давности, и они в семь раз с половиной, в семь с половиной раз хуже, чем объемный материал вакуумным методом полученный. Но, допустим, для инжекта этот показатель в пять раз. То есть мы приблизительно на уровне уже. Сейчас мы понизили, понизили сопротивление и уже ниже, чем у инжекта. И сколько сейчас? А сейчас уже примерно в два раза ниже. То есть 0,25. А каким образом? То есть что, что, вы, по, что вы поменяли? Да, 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 пористы. Мы смогли повысить толщину ДЭСа, при этом а, смогли увеличить температуру во время процесса. То есть они остались пористыми. И, их толч... Мы смогли повысить их толщину, толщину, то есть поперечное сечение проводника у нас возросло. Ну и за счет этого получается... Да, это небольшая хитрость, но да, пористость, конечно, стала меньше. То есть у нас была пористость 1 микрон, она стала ниже. Ну и как бы это... Ну, то метод... есть это возникает вопрос, как считать это удельное сопротивление, так ведь? Ну, а... то есть как оценить действительно толщину, если у вас там вот эти поры? Так? Видите ли, в чем дело? Просто толщина нашего покрытия на самом деле ограничена двумя боковыми пиками. Сейчас я покажу. Вот по краям двумя боковыми пиками, да. а средняя часть у нас толщ... толщиной 500 нанометров на самом деле. То есть если мы поменяем распределение потока, сейчас у нас по гауссу, то мы уберем эти пики и выйдем как раз таки в толщины, которые, так скажем, сложно доступны для инжекта. Хорошо. Так, а у меня вопрос. А почему у вас а, там после лазерной оплаты у, у вас становится проводящий? Из-за чего? Из-за там углерод там, еще, или из-за меда? А, спасибо за вопрос. Сейчас я покажу. А, видите, у нас в составе есть а, отстат меди. Собственно, облучая лазером, мы выжигаем наш ДЭС и медь у нас восстанавливается до собственной металлической фазы. То есть у нас остается медная дорожка из этого раствора. ДЭС нам нужен только для того, чтобы у нас понизить температуру плавления, чтобы, собственно, восстановилась медь и осадить эту дорожку. А углерод, конечно, может остаться, но его можно просто убрать, вымыв. Мы проводили тесты на сгибание, больше 100 сгибаний и изменений не было. То есть мы пока еще не сделали установочку, чтобы она там тысячи и десятки тысяч сгибаний сделать. Вы говорили, что можно использовать гибкие подложки для ваших экспериментов. А, собственно, такой вопрос, насколько устойчивым остается вся эта структура, например, при вот тех же самых 100 сгибаниях или, например, при растяжении. Вы как-то оценивали это? Да, спасибо за вопрос. На сгибание мы вот провели тестирование, у нас изменение по сопротивлению не превышало 10%. Но мы это свели к тому, что это погрешность измерений. На самом деле 10% не так уж много. На растяжение мы пока не проверяли. Гибкая подложка, ее удобство в том, что мы все-таки предполагаем, что несмотря на то, что сильно понизили мощность облучаемую, она все равно впекается, все равно впекается в полиэмид. То есть она как бы закрепляется в поверхности полиэмида, и поэтому именно адгезия обусловлена этим. Ну, вопрос все же был про форму, насколько я понял. Да? Насколько, насколько устойчив... не сопротивление меняется, а форма. Вот насколько а, держится... вы имеете в виду, насколько деградирует? Да, струк... 
А насчет этого да, сохраняется в 100% случаев, только если вы механически начнете воздействовать, то есть там наждачку возьмете, тогда, конечно, да. Да, да. Как... Вот как раз для этого мы будем собирать установку, чтобы проверить вот эти измерения. Ну, я предлагаю да, закончить дискуссию, перейти к следующему докладу. Давайте поблагодарим еще раз. The next talk uh, by Professor Huang lays the integration of metal-organic frameworks on thermoplastic polyurethane for robust flexible electronics. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, maybe I should stay here so it's so better to talk to you. Oh, it's so loud. Uh, so my name is Juan, so I'm from Tons Polytechnic University. Uh, and uh, today I would like to present you a work about laser integration of metal organic framework on thermoplastic polyurethane for robust flexible electronics. Okay, nice. Uh, so as you know, so now flexible electronics is now quite popular and, uh, and uh, the continuous health monitoring is one of the most application. So why? Because uh, so you have a, from the human body, you have a lot of parameters that you can uh, record and track it continuously, like uh, the pulse rate, uh, temperature, pressure, and so, Many parameters, if we use AI, we use machine learning for uh, big data, and then we can analyze it and we can predict. So let's eat much. So cancer is a big problem, right? So the thing is, if we can predict it, we can know the cancer in the early stage, so we can save a lot of people from that. And that is the idea for the future of uh, flexible electronics. And flexible electronics, so the key thing is we should have something flexible. Flexible that we, you can attach on the human skin and you will feel comfortable when you move. And, uh, and there we, uh, so uh, thanks to that, so we can use for a long time. And from flexible, we can use for different application like a sensor or photosynthesis or some uh, uh, other visualization. So flexible substrate is quite important than the substrate that we need to fight. There are a lot of uh, different substrates that we can use, uh, but in our case, we use polyurethane. So we have polyurethane and it is quite popular and uh, we have a high abrasion resistance, tear resistance uh, and it has a, it's stable at high temperature. But flexible substrate is not enough because from the substrate you need to f uh, take uh, some uh, information from that. And conductivity is one of the way to make it. And, um, but uh, from that we can use uh, different materials. And in our, in our work we use the metal organic framework is one of the popular materials uh, that is using now. So metal organic framework is that it, here you can see a lot of materials uh, that called metal organic framework that you have metal and you have a ligand that connect them. So you, it's like a cage that uh, you connect and you can control the pore size uh, and different form of metal organic framework. It has been used for a lot of application like a sensor, uh, gas absorption and especially for hydrogen absorption. Now it's quite popular for now. Uh, drug delivery. But the problem with the metal organic framework is not conductive because electricity, uh, electrical signal is one of the key things when you use the uh, electronics, right? Uh, because you can take the signal and you convert the signal to, to deliver, to transfer to different, uh, to, to different device. And unfortunately, with the one we use is uh, uh, zinc uh, imitidazone uh, framework uh, it's, uh, is, uh, can use for different applications, but it's not conductive. And one of the things that we think, if we use the mas um, this material, because it has a really high surface area, and we can use uh, laser to update it to uh, see that what can we do with uh, that material. And you can see that in our case, we use drop casting, 
and of the ZIF8 on, uh, on the TPU substrate, and then we use laser to irradiate it, and then after laser irradiation, you can see that we have, <laughs> it become black, totally black. Uh, it is different from the white source ZIF8, and uh, so, and it is conductive. And we also, that we test the stability that uh, because it's the most important thing that we put in sonication for 30 minutes and after sonication you can see that our substrate is still have a really good uh, integration. So the laser irradiated ZF8 integrated really well on the substrate. And so we would like to discover what is mechanism behind it. And we, uh, one of the key things that we can use is we use Raman spectroscopy, and so we got, we got Raman spectroscopy of the ZIF-8 before irradiation, and it totally uh, correspond to the ZIF-8. And after laser irradiation, we see that there is presence of the D, G, and 2D peaks. It's the, uh, the peak which is related to graphene-like uh, materials. So mostly the conductivity that we have is mostly that we have from graphene-like materials. It makes it conductive. Uh, and then we test, we, so it's flexible and we want to try to test it for bending sensor. So you, here you can see that uh, the resistance according to uh, at different deformation. And you see, when you increase the deformation, so the resistance increase. So for, from that, we can use for bending sensors, like uh, to use, uh, so when you bend it, you know the, how much degree that you bend, and to control a different uh, machine. Uh, stability also the, the key thing that we would like to emphasize here, and so we uh, test the, uh, Stability uh, up to 1,000 bending times. So because of limited time, and we uh, so we test only with 1,000 times, but it can uh, in principle it can stay uh, be stable more. And you can see that uh, up to 10,000 times. So mostly the substrate is stable. Uh, and so can we play? No. So. So actually, that uh, we we also test uh, uh, make a prototype for the pressure sensor. Uh, maybe it does not work. Okay. So and we uh, we make a prototype for pressure sensor and it's uh, it works. Uh, one more thing that we discovered that uh, when we uh, test it with uh, spectrum and we see that uh, here on the left side you can see the graphic with the uh, photoluminescence of the TPU. Uh, this is uh, unirated, so, so this is source TPU. And after laser irradiation, so you can see that you have a broad peak of photoluminescence. Uh, then when it's already burned, so you also have the peak of photoluminescence. So here on the right, you can see that uh, this is the photoluminescence uh, uh, at different irradiation time. So we irradiate it, and you can see that at the first time we have really small uh, signal from TPU, but after that we uh, we have really high signal. We have a signal of the photoluminescence, uh, and so from that, if we control the time, the irradiation time, you can enhance the photoluminescence uh, signal. Here, in case we enhance, uh, it could be enhanced uh, about ten times. Uh, and so that is a substrate. We also think about the ZIF-8, the materials that we have. So what could it be changed? And here we write it uh, at the center. So you see on the left, uh, left, uh, left top corner. So we, this is a PL map of the, the ZIF-8. And then on the right after laser radiation, in the center spot, you can see that so it uplate in center spot, but around it. The area around it, so we have the photoluminescence increase uh, is enhanced. So thanks to the gradient, temperature gradient, and here you can see the, the profile on the left bottom corner that uh, when it close close to the ablation spot, the PL also increase. 
increase in our case. And we invest, uh, when we feed the PR with two pigs, and we see that when we close to the spot, there is uh, um, two pigs also have the sheep, uh, the red sheep. <laughs> and we also, the pig ratio between the, uh, the, uh, the pig is increased when we go close uh, to the uh, laser spot. So the reason behind it, we suppose, uh, because we need to have more investigation, because we suppose that we, because when we upload it, we have introduced some graphene. But not only graphene, but from the zinc, uh, zinc egg, we can have about the carbon nitride or end of graphene. It can be the source or from the uh, zinc oxide, but we are investigating now. And next, uh, goes to the application of the PL. So we also, uh, we think that because of PL, yeah, why not to make the temperature sensor? And with the human body, so the human body temperature is really critical. We test the temperature from 27 to 45 degrees. And you can see that when, uh, when you increase the temperature, the intensity of the PL peak decrease. And uh, it de decreases. Uh, here you can see the uh, peak of, um, in the first stage is not so linear, but it shows the possibility to de detect the temperature sensor by the PL, especially at the uh, te temperature of the human body from 27 to 45 degrees. Uh, so my conclusion is in the screen, uh, I would like to give thanks to the Russian S Science uh, Foundation and my team for supporting of this work. So, thank you very much. Thank you. So, it, it seems we start from sensors, t temperature, and we also end tem with temperature sensors. I, I absolutely cannot understand which laser you used. Uh, uh, so, if, uh, for, just for laser irradiation. <laughs> for the uh, ablation uh, of the uh, ZIF ed, we use the millisecond laser the wavelength of 450 nanometers. It's important to have a certain wavelengths. What happens? In uh, the, the thing is, we use, uh, of course, uh, here you, you are expert in laser, but we use a millisecond laser, so mostly that we investigated is uh, the thermal, uh, the um, uh, photothermal mechanism. So that we uh, heat it up and we induce graphene. Uh, because of Raman, so we, when we're going to see, we see the shape of the peak, we see that... If you will have high intensity to the peak, it will be certainly single layer, but in this case, it's multi-layer, so it's... Uh, n n yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it has presence of graphene, but so certainly multi-layer. Uh, yes, uh, I, I... No. <laughs> <laughs> The, the thing is, uh, the, the thing is uh, okay, uh, yes, of course, we have a multi-layer, but the thing that we, we showed that they also, I had a discussion with my supervisor yesterday, uh, but w if we define the graphene, if we say that uh, it's only from one to five layers, in principle, if we have graphene oxide, for example, you cannot call it graphene oxide, because for sure you have about 100 nanometers. Uh, but here we have, uh, there is one more uh, term, is called the twist graphene that you have one layer graphene and uh, one layer, another graphene on the top, and it's not AB stacking, but it twist. That, that time you have a decoupled graphene, but you have two layer, uh, you have a bilayer, but you have your two layers of graphene, decoupled, and it can be called the graphene. Can you say about the stability of uh, resistance of your quasi-graphene layers to atmosphere this time? Uh, to atmosphere? Uh, actually, we didn't make the task in, in the atmosphere, and we just test the stability. Because all of our, the, the key thing in our method we produce is almost atmosphere. We iterate in the atmosphere, and everything we make, it, like to make it, make it simple, of, uh, simplify everything, and to make it easy to, uh, to make the device.
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that is a really interesting question because we we'll also tried uh, PDMS uh, for this. But the thing that, um, uh, the thing when you iterate it with PDMS, PDMS just evaporate, right? So you do not have integration. The, the thing we use TPU and we have really, really good integration and you see that we have a quite robust, uh, flexible sensor. Yeah, just may not fly away, that's all. Let speaker thank again. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you. So now the session is closed. And we have time for coffee break.
the to talk. <laughs> it's a very small and we have a lot of time for questions. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Sergei Yereska uh, from Samara branch of the Lebedev Physical Institute. Please. You have more than 15 minutes. <laughs> 20. It, it was a joke, yes. 20 minutes. 20, okay, 20. Uh, 20 with questions. Dear colleagues, my name is Sergei Reska. I present the work uh, performed uh, by uh, researchers by three organizations. It uh, is uh, this uh, Samara branch, uh, Lebedev Physical Institute, and, and um, Research Institute of Physics, uh, Southern Federal University, and uh, Rostov State Transport University. Uh, the work is devoted to the um, analysis of the composition of and characteristics uh, the thin surface layer of the laser treatment zone after laser modification in air. Uh, uh, the small introduction to the history. Uh, it's known must studies. Uh, in the field of interaction of the laser radiation with uh, matter, with steel and alloys, uh, uh, are devoted to the analysis of change uh, uh, in the structure of phase, modif phase uh, composition in the zone of the thermal influence at depths from several uh, 10 microns or to several millimeters. It's well known. No. This uh, change determines the complex uh, mechanical and wear, wear resistance, thermal heat, uh, uh, heat resistance and um, corrosion resistance characteristics. Our work, uh, in our work, the, we can see the um, uh, influence of laser radiation on thin uh, layer, tak, uh, oxide layer uh, nanometers. Uh, Depth, nanometers, uh, thinness. Uh, this uh, problem is uh, smaller than uh, structure construction, structure uh, with uh, smaller depth. Тем не менее, ой, sorry. However, the use of oxide, oxide так, так, это, uh, however, the uh, use of oxide films of uh, creating color images, metal decoration, and uh, laser marking is well known. Is well known. So, so the uh, increase of in the corrosion resistance of surface of laser treatment zo zone uh, due to the uh, improvement uh, of the passivation properties of the surface layer and its microstructural homogenization is also well known. The oxide, uh, the oxide films of the laser treatment zone surface uh, have a significant effect of the wear process of the uh, hardened uh, tool. Uh, the results of the analysis of the wear rate of the steel measurement of the parameters of the plastic deformation in the chip deformation zone indicate this. Uh, Laser treatment in air stabilizes the process of the tool wear, minimizes the rate of the, its wear, leads to the significant expense 
expansion of the range of the cutting regimes at which its uh, lowest uh, wear is achieved. Previously, method, uh, the, uh, method, method of the electrochemical analysis and uh, spectroscopy was uh, were used for the, this, uh, for the study the characteristic of the thin oxide films, uh, namely the uh, thinness, uh, composition, structure. In our work, we used X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy for analysis of the uh, characteristic oxide films uh, created uh, on the surface uh, laser treatment zone. Surface on the treatment zone. The main results, the main results uh, obtained early are the formed uh, oxide films in the multi-component and multi-layer with a thickness of uh, no more than 20 hundred nanometers. nanometers. The purpose of work is, uh, of the, uh, the purpose and task of the study are shown on the slide number nine. The object of the study, the characteristic of the used laser sources and the appearance of the surface of the laser treatment zone presented here. Presented here. Uh, the characteristic of the equipment for study uh, of the surface oxidized of the laser treatment zone are surface analysis system with ion profiling and tribometer of Anton Park Corporation. At the first step, uh, survey uh, spectra was obtained from, uh, both from the uh, initial surface of the studied uh, steel and uh, from the laser treatment zone surface of the sun materials in the wide range of the electron binding energies, characterizing the elementar composition of the surface. This uh, show in the slide. Then elementa elementar composition of the steel surface where was investigated by depth of the oxidized layer and the concentration profiles of the main elements of the surface layer of steel were constructed depending on the time of the iron itching. It's, we can see uh, for steel 9HS, uh, at other the concentration of uh, oxygen and uh, carbon uh, decrease. Uh, at the same time, the concentration of ferrum is uh, increased, all, st all, style, all, all steel. Uh, it is interesting that the, uh, consists the plata for uh, steel R6, uh, R6 M5 and steel R9 K5. Uh, for steel R9K5, uh, this plata uh, consists from uh, etching time 0.8 hours to 4.5 hours. Uh, it can be assumed that is the depth of the modified layer, uh, that is uh, at this depth, um, of modified layer iron is a ferrum uh, two plus uh, oxidation state corresponding to ferrum O oxide. oxide. Similarly, profiles of the concentration of alloying and some impurity elements were constructed for, for other steels where, where was investigated. Uh, for the steel uh, R9K5, uh, uh, tungsten at depth after 5 hours and 30 minutes of etching begins to en enrich the analysis layers, reaching to 10.6%. Uh,
According to the result of the treatment of the spectra of internal levels, the depth distribution of metallic and oxide components of iron in the oxide layer and uh, the boundary for the uh, studied uh, steels were obtained. The thickness of the oxide layers for the modified surface of uh, 9XC and R6M5 steel were uh, uh, 530 angstrom and uh, 2160 angstrom respectively. For the accurate uh, estimate of the chemical state of iron, the ferrum 2P spectra of iron for of uh, U8 and uh, U10 steel obtained during the old etching time along the depth of the oxide layer were decomposite, decomposite of into components corresponding to, uh, corresponding to a particular valence of iron. Oh, the result of this decomposition is the graphs on slide 16. Uh, based on the data, data of the graphs, the relative position and the thinness of various oxides are schematically shown in the figure of the slide 16. The thicknesses of the oxide layer Taking into account uh, the iron ancient rate, three, three angstrom per minute uh, are here. We can see for steel uh, U8, the um, oxidized layer e have a thickness uh, 38.7 nanometers and uh, full, uh, sorry, uh, Total thickness of oxidized layer is 225 nanometers. And for steel uh, U10, oxidized layer, full oxidized layer, have uh, thickness uh, 99 nanometers. And uh, full total thickness, uh, including uh, oxidized level and uh, some uh, transition layer, um, is uh, 180 nanometers. Uh, 180 uh, nanometers. Uh, the um, for steel, for steel uh, R9K5, the chemical state of iron was estimated by ferrum 2P spectra of iron of iron. The distribution of uh, iron at its oxide over the depth and uh, distribution of metal atoms of the alloying elements and the oxides uh, also given here slide number 17. We have according uh, uh, on the base of this graph was uh, the construct the uh, Diagram of location and oxide by depth at after uh, laser treatment. The total uh, uh, thickness of uh, oxide layer is uh, 130 nanometers, including the oxide's uh, main elements, ferrum, and uh, alloying elements, uh, uh, namely uh, molybdenum or O2 and uh, tungsten O3, cobalt O and chrome 2 O3 and other. The, the results of the tribological uh, test uh, presented in this uh, presented in table one. We can see that uh, the um, wear rate for uh, uh, steel. Eight, U8 after laser treatment uh, decreased by 17 percent. Uh, uh, for steel uh, U10 after laser treatment, uh, wear rate uh, decreased uh, more than 2.3 times. Uh, this can be explained. Uh, this presence the more highly exceeds on the surface layer 
uh, after laser treatment. After four, sorry, four uh, steel R9 K5 and a layer of soft iron oxide at a depth of uh, 90 nanometers, uh, uh, layer with uh, tungsten and vanadium hardened grain boundaries appear. This uh, can leads to the uh, can that contact spot area of the test ball is significantly smaller uh, than uh, when friction on the under traces surface. There were, uh, there were rules fixed during nanotriber test confirm behavior of a uh, hardened uh, tool made of the steel R9K5 uh, at turning structural steel. It should be noted that uh, high, stability, high stability of the cutting process uh, for tool treated in iron curve 2 is contrast to cutters hardened uh, in argon curve 3 or untreated curve, curve 1. Curve one. Based on the result of the, this work, the following conclusion can be made. The main conclusions uh, contained data related, uh, re related the synthesis and phase composition of oxide film of the surface of the letter, uh, laser treatment zone of tool steel of various composition. Regarding of the tribological properties of the surface of steel after laser treatment, the conclusion was that the composition of oxide film and their synthesis uh, determine the very characteristic of the surface. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you for your talk. Do you have any questions? Окей, okay, I have a question. Uh, на русском, да, просили? Давайте на русском. Да, если можно. Uh, вот uh, вы исследуете трение, да? Uh, если, uh, Я слушаю, да. Да, с помощью лазерной обработки. У вас uh, изменяет трение, в том числе изменяются и другие свойства. И вот какое дальше вы планируете, как применять вашу лазерно-индуцированную поверхность? И uh, какие еще свойства нужно исследовать, и влияет ли на какие свойства, там, не знаю, на твердость, на, там, может быть, смачиваемость, Нет, может быть, другие? Мы исследуем целый комплекс свойств, начиная от э, поверхностной, там, типа, там, шероховатость, вот эти все, то есть поверхность свойств, это все исследуется, безусловно. Это исследуется толщина пленок. Как оказалось, они тоже оказывают огромное влияние на все контактные процессы. Вот эти стали, которые я назвал У8, У10, это стали, так сказать, эфтектоидного класса, они используются для изготовления высокоточного мерительного инструмента, типа пробок, калибров, где, понимаете, сами износ поверхности, в принципе, не допустим, потому что они используются как калибры, как эталоны используются. Дальше мы установили, что вот эти пленки, они оказывают достаточно существенное влияние на управление процессом контактного взаимодействия при трении, при трении, причем инструмента. Хотя вот это парадоксально, на мой взгляд, это самое, потому что э, само, само по себе трение при э, инструменте, при работе инструмента, это высокие температуры, высокие давления. Но тем не менее, вот эти пленки, они позволяют управлять, позволяют, как я уже сказал, стабилизировать процесс изнашивания, расширить тот диапазон, где наблюдается повышенная, что называется, э, резистент, повышенная износостойкость инструмента. То есть мы управляем структурами пленок, их составом, а состав пленок, сами понимаете, его можно регулировать, изменяя параметры лазерной обработки. То есть управляя характеристиками пленок, мы в то же время начинаем управлять процессами трения. А вы пробовали одновременно изменять и рельеф поверхности, и создавать оксидную пленку, например, тонкую на поверхности. Как здесь будет влиять на процесс трения? Опять же, может быть, там Нет, в том числе с жидкостями? Нет, мы это не пробовали по одной простой причине, что я всегда говорил и придерживаюсь той точки зрения, что а, лазерная обработка, хотя, естественно, а, процесс рельеф изменяется, когда у нас идет а, мелтинг. Плавление идет, правильно? Я всегда регламентирую, это, говорю, что процессы обработки 
упрочняющей обработки, их необходимость называется, проводить без оплавления поверхности. Потому что это оплавление оно повышает, резко повышает трудоемкость самого процесса подготовки инструмента. И поэтому, ну, естественно, иногда, иногда повыш... для ряда стали повышается глубина зоны упрочнения. Глубина зоны упрочнения – это значит изменяется контактное условие взаимодействия, то есть вы можете использовать это в более каком-то широком диапазоне. Но мы всегда говорим об обработке без оплавления. То есть угу. вот этот параметр как шероховатость, мы его не рассматриваем в принципе здесь. Хорошо, спасибо. Вопрос? А, вот вы говорили о механических свойствах, а исследовали вы их электрические, проводимость, оптические константы? Потому что во многих какие, областях… О каких оптических константах здесь может быть речь, когда мы имеем дело со сталью? Ну, только, почему? Только коэффициент отражения. Ну да, но и в разных спектральных областях, то есть вы этим нет, не занимаетесь задачами? Нет, нет, нет. Угу. Здесь чисто такие прагматические вопросы. Ну, видно в зависимости от применения, опять же, дальше. Да. Мы идем от задач, от применения. Uh -huh. Потому что мы эти стали, это стали промышленного производства, и мы идем от производства. А вот эти научные задачи, типа там э, структура пленок, их толщина, характеристики, это уже для нас получается вторично, но тем не менее это составляет некую научную составляющую вот этих вот всех работ. Спасибо. Спасибо за доклад. Вот жалко выключили. Там у вас вот рисом вы когда идете, вот неужели пленка там 150-200 нанометров может как-то повлиять да, на этот резец? Да. Вот показал, там же снашиваемость вот эта. Да, 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 я согласен, Она же эти вот 200 нанометров сразу значит, сотрет. Существ... Сейчас я поясню. Значит, я проводил специальные исследования. Вот буквально не, не слайд. тут дальше у вас там, по-моему, было. Вот. вот, вот не, вот, еще, вот. еще дальше. Нет, вот. вот это характерно. Видите? Вот Где здесь резец? Есть данные, здесь есть данные, которые... Вон у вас микрон минуту стачивается, да? да? Вот от скорости резца, да? А у вас 30 микрон в минуту стачивается, у вас пленка 200 нанометров, и чего? Она создает предысторию, предысторию, и уже с этой историей он входит уже в контактное взаимодействие. Смотрите, что здесь получается, это нижний слайд. Да. У нас процесс стабилизируется, он становится более стабильным процесс. А это очень, это, это, это очень важно для процесса резания. Вот скажите, вы же сначала этот резец подготовили, вот 200 нанометров создали пленку, а потом уже его вот там 60-50 метров в минуту режете, да? Да. И вот 60 микрон он у вас источился просто, да? Я так понимаю, это износ резца. И что там эти 200 ваши 0,2 микрона... Где они тут? Непонятно. Непонятно. Вот непонятно. Но тем не менее, я говорю, это можно не понять, но тем не менее, я говорю, что а, вот эта вот лазерная обработка, она оказывает, э, расширяет область режимов, когда наблюдается стабильный износ. А уменьшение коэффициента, вариа... уменьшение коэффициента вариации стойкости – один из немаловажных параметров для того, чтобы нормально эксплуатировался инструмент. Как-то по физике это объяснить можно? Я думаю, что можно в клуарах продолжить. Спасибо. Okay, uh, the next talk uh, from uh, Institute of Automation and Electrometry. Uh, Roman Kutz, please. Uh, hello everyone. everyone, I'm glad to talk in the conference. Uh, my work is about the direct laser writing on thin metal uh, silicon contained films uh, in the field of uh, diffract diffractive optics. So my work is done in the Institute of Automation Electrometry of the Siberian branch of Russian Acad Ad Academy of Science in Novosibirsk. So first of all, there are a lot of uh, applications uh, which uh, used uh, diffractive optical elements and the main technology to produce this uh, DOI uh, is the direct laser writing on thin metal film. Uh, so 
there are some ways to uh, develop this technology, this uh, increasing of uh, the special resolution, uh, fighting the new no-cost uh, solutions and uh, uh, fixing the errors associated with the uh, thermochemical processes and uh, technological stages. So, and uh, uh, the main widely used uh, technology of uh, phase dye production is uh, direct laser writing on thin uh, chromium film. Uh, so, uh, firstly, uh, we'll focus laser beam uh, hit the surface of uh, uh, chromium film and uh, uh, oxide uh, mask appear and this uh, uh, mask is uh, so the mask um, in during uh, the next uh, stage of uh, chromium wet etching. So after this we can uh, use the reactive ion etching uh, for uh, uh, modificate surface and uh, give uh, face micro relief uh, in few silica substrate. Uh, so uh, we uh, suggest the new uh, approach uh, of variation of this technology uh, using uh, additional silicon layer uh, and uh, this uh, bilayer film uh, have uh, some advantages. Uh, uh, firstly, these are uh, anti-reflection properties uh, and uh, we can uh, increase the absorption uh, of uh, Belair film in uh, writing wavelength. Uh, and uh, the next one is protection of uh, the chromium film from natural oxidation. Uh, and uh, the next uh, main advantage is visualization of the laser writing process uh, without the etching procedure. And uh, the last one is uh, that the silicon is the reagent for the formation of silicides. Uh, but uh, this modification uh, needs to, uh, to use uh, additional stage of uh, silicon wet etching. So, uh, as I had uh, said that uh, we can adjust uh, um, the peak of absorption of bilayer film. Uh, so in the left uh, graph, we can see dependence of the optimal silicon uh, uh, film thickness uh, on wavelength. Uh, and uh, the right data uh, show us that uh, we can uh, decrease uh, reflection of uh, bilayer film uh, about three times. Uh, uh, in comparison of uh, chromium, clean chromium film. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, we make, made uh, some test writings uh, using the XYL laser nanolithography system uh, with uh, wavelength uh, 40, 405 nanometer and uh, uh, the diameter of uh, writing spot about 700 nanometer. And uh, in the right picture we can see uh, reflection microimages of the uh, um, power tests in uh, the films with uh, uh, different thickness uh, silicon layer layers. Uh, these are zero uh, thickness, so clean chrome. Um, 5 and uh, 16 nanometer. Uh, so uh, we can see that uh, with increasing the silicon thickness, uh, the uh, power range of uh, thermochemical uh, process is, uh, is increased and uh, this is uh, very important advantage of this technology. So we obtained uh, uh, the reflection, power reflection uh, characteristics of these writings and we can see that uh, 
using uh, of uh, silic uh, five nanometer thick silicon uh, bilayer film, we can uh, obtain uh, more uh, fast uh, threshold uh, power threshold of thermochemical process, and this fact uh, can uh, give. Uh, possibility to uh, use this technology for uh, uh, for very uh, resolution writings so uh, we try to wrote uh, resolution tests in uh, chromium and uh, silicon chromium films and uh, as we can see the using the Eight nanometer silicon layer, we can uh, increase the uh, special resolution about 25 percent, and uh, so we uh, demonstrate this uh, variation of uh, laser writing technology on chromium film. Uh, firstly, and uh, we hope uh, that we um, make the research in detail in future so uh, I thank my uh, colleagues in institute and uh, uh, Russian Science Fo Foundation and uh, thank you for your attention okay thank you for your talk okay do you have any questions okay oh, no. При малой мощности почти не отражает, да? Ну, смотрите. Потом начинает отражать. Сейчас, секунду. Вот это, да, вот левая картинка. Я лучше не эту картинку покажу, а вот сам процесс. А, смотрите, чем меньше мощности мы светим, тем тоньше создается э, оксидный слой, и тем, соответственно, хуже он э, играет э, защитную роль при следующем этапе отравления хрома. То есть после этапа отравления хрома у нас э, вот эти столбики хромовые становятся тоньше, и они, грубо говоря, пропускают больше и, соответственно, отражают меньше. Вот. То есть вот эти картинки, которые, про которые вы спросили, они уже после отравления хрома. Вот. То есть э, маленькое отражение соответствует тоненькому слою хрома, соответственно, высокое отражение – это хороший слой хрома. Вот. Ну а то, что вот на 16 нанометрах кремния видно, что они желтеют, это уже образуются те самые силициды, вот, которые э, вносят свой вклад вот в синенький график э, слева, вот, и поэтому тоже уменьшают немножко отражение, хотя э, если смотреть зависимость толщины оставшейся маски, то она тоже будет резким образом меняться, не так плавно, как отражение. Силициды, это силицию, мы хром взаимным, да? Да. Диффузию, да? да, да? да, да. А какой толщины этот слой силицидов? Слой, ну, мы пока не оценивали. Мы проводили эту работу для титановых пленок. Более детально мы и спектроскопию смотрели, Романовскую. Вот. И там э, слой сравним с, соответственно, с толщиной э, нашей кремниевой пленки. Да, то есть это десяток нанометров, может, 15-20 вот так. Еще сильно нагревается, да? Смотрите, опять же, для титановых силицидов температура образования силицидов была примерно 600-700 градусов, но это из литературы. Вот. Но при увеличении температуры, а при, мы как бы нагреваем очень сильно, да, там полторы тысячи градусов, бывает там, что плавленый кварц плавится. Вот. При увеличении температуры создаются силициды просто других фаз. Как это называется? Других фаз. Вот.
насколько я понял, вот именно применение данных структур это для создания дифракционных оптических элементов видимого диапазона. Да? Да. А вот какое разрешение вот, пространственное, может, я прослушал, вот можно создать такое, и насколько глубокие эту структуру можно делать, какие у них, насколько вертикальные стенки, или можно ли сделать непрерывный рельеф, вот, ну, что важно для таких элементов. Ну, смотрите, с конца начну. Чтобы создать непрерывный рельеф, нужно создать грубо говоря, непрерывную, непрерывно изменяющуюся толщину хрома маски. Это мы вот последние разработки делаем. Нам, у нас удается создать полутоновые, так скажем, маски. Вот, и мы таким образом сможем создать полутоновой рельеф уже, ой, не полутоновой, а как, кусочно непрерывный именно микрорельеф в кварце. Собственно, это применяется в резистной технологии. Вот здесь просто речь идет про прямую лазерную без резиста. Вот. А касательно пространственного разрешения, там в конце был график, собственно, показывающий, что нашим пучком, да, 700 нанометров, мы можем создать вот при толщине кремния 0, да, просто при хромовой технологии, тоже порядка этой, этой же цифры э, линию. Вот. А при добавлении кремния у нас за счет пороговости записи, да, мы тут, к сожалению, не видно, наверное. Не видно тут. А, вот видите, на правом э, графике у нас схема. Вот. Если у нас очень резкая пороговая запись, то мы можем записывать только самым пиком гауссового пятна. Вот. А тут еще зеленым показано как бы не гауссовое пятно. Мы можем использовать не гауссовое пятно, если э, дополнительно вот эти лепестки лежат меньше порога по мощности, значит они не будут влиять на пространственное разрешение, и мы будем вообще узенькую линию писать. Такую работу мы тоже проводили, но на просто хромовой технологии. Вот. То есть э, можно там нашим пятном да, 700 нанометров писать, допустим, полмикрона. Вот. При уменьшении, соответственно, пятна. Вот у нас есть вот эта установка, вот, вот эта да, установка, там 350 нанометров пятно, соответственно, мы можем еще меньше записать линию. Вот. Вертикальность стенок – это уже как бы другой абсолютно вопрос, это вопрос реактивного ионного отравления, но для задач дифракционной оптики как бы вроде как удовлетворяют, погрешность дифракционной эффективности там на уровне процентов плавает при разных как бы, стадиях травления. Поэтому как бы, нас удовлетворяет, но конкретно какой угол наклона не могу сказать. Еще вопросы? У меня еще был вопрос по восьмому, по-моему, слайду. А там у вас оптимальная толщина. Так, сейчас седьмой, восьмой. Да, оптимальная толщина кремния получается порядка 7-8 нанометров да, да. для записи вот, э, наиболее узкой, э, узкого трека. Вот mm -hmm. Можете объяснить, почему? Ну, Какая-то физика процесса. Uh, ну, смотрите, получается, чем... Uh, смотрите, uh, пространственное разрешение зависит от, в данном случае от uh, скорости там, растекания тепла по поверхности. Вот мы светим лазерным пучком да, какую-то дорожку, у нас тепло начинает расплываться, и вот насколько оно успеет разойтись, вот, вырасти оксидный вот этот слой, вот такая толщина дорожки и будет. Вот. А когда мы используем дополнительную пленку э, кремния, она обладает там, другой температуропроводностью, вот, э, и поэтому вот эти термич... как это сказать, терм термические свойства вот этого двуслойного материала уже другие, поэтому изменяется пространственное разрешение. Но еще вот, ну и соответственно, чем толще вот, это, вот этот слой кремния, тем меньше растекания тепла по поверхности будет. Вот. Но получается сильно толстым мы не можем его делать, потому что с другой стороны это ограничивает как раз диффузию кислорода и диффузию там, взаимную диффузию кремния и хрома. Вот. То есть если мы сильно толстый слой крем, кремния сделаем, то, тогда мы будем модифицировать только слой кремния, и тогда ничего такого не будет. Тоже вот. Это оптимальная толщина для диффузии? А, ну вот с двух сторон процесс, uh -huh. как бы, вот он оптимизирует именно вот на этой толщине. Ну мы, по крайней мере, так получили пока что. Это вот первые результаты в данной как бы, технологии. Вот. Будем дальше изучать. Так, спасибо. Да, вопрос. 
у меня возник ответ здесь с предыдущим вашим. Возник вопрос здесь с предыдущим вашим ответом а, про растекание тепла и повышение в связи с этим а, разрешения. А какой лазер вы используете, с какой длиной импульса? Смотрите, вообще данная технология, она, точнее, данная установка, она призвана сделать науку для того, чтобы в дальнейшем эти режимы применять на более используемой нами установке уже круговой лазерной записывающей системы. Вот, вот, вот это, да. С подобными параметрами. И тут мы используем только непрерывную запись. Соответственно, когда я записывал на установке, вот, которую я до этого показывал, там я приближал длительность и период импульсов, параметры, которые создают вот длительность и период импульсов выбраны, я приближал к непрерывной записи на высокой скорости. То есть там у меня была, был короткий импульс и низкая скорость, а здесь у нас будет непрерывный, соответственно, свет, но высокая скорость. И вот я по экспозиции подбирал так, чтобы как бы, параметры соответствовали, но, соответственно, импульсы мы использовали там 2 микросекунды длительность, период, соответственно, такой, чтобы там он через 250 нанометров светил. Вот. То есть никакой не пика не фемта секунд. Можно добиться большей локализации эффекта, если использовать там фемтосекундные импульсы, которые могут достигать до 20 фемтосекунд. Но тогда получается мощность надо увеличивать, правильно? Она увеличится в мощность внутри, а, как то, сказать, внутри да. импульса. То есть ну, он сжимается просто во времени. Может быть. А, просто те величины, они огромные, он будет растекаться, очень сильно будет растекаться тепло. Ну вот э, мы очень много использовали, исследовали вот запись на вот этой установке, да, где мы можем скорость записи, скорость сканирования менять. Э, то, что вы говорите, это сравнимо с тем, что мы просто очень быстро начнем сканировать. Нет, нет, сам импульс просто будет очень короткий. Я так понял, вы стремитесь к тому, чтобы был один импульс на одну точку, и они не пересекались, то есть не копить тепло в одной точке, правильно? Ну, Опять же, я говорю, что мы моделируем импульсной записью, непрерывную запись, но с большей скоростью. И чем, ну вот, по как бы, термическим... Ну сколько импульсов на точку получает? Ну или там на миллиметр? Ну через 250 нанометров. Соответственно, на микрон это 4 импульса, на миллиметр 4000 импульсов. Ну они накладываются друг на друга в пространстве. Да, 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 конечно. Потому что размер у нас 700 нанометров, а мы через 250 светим. А какие еще вопросы, какие преимущества перед традиционной литографией ультрафиолетом через маски? Еще раз. Преимущества перед традиционной литографией. А традиционная имеется в виду с резистом? Да, литография через маски. Ну, смотрите, резист это уже дополнительный жидкостный этап, который вносит погрешность, вносит неоднородность там, и так далее. И плюс скорость. Ну, и, смотрите, засветка резист, резиста уже больше, меньше пространственное разрешение обеспечит, я так понимаю. То есть нужно использовать очень хорошие резисты, чтобы получить, например, полмикрона. Ну почему? Десятки нанометров? Ну это вы вот. электронным пучком, правильно, светите? Нет, ультрафиолет. То, что чем делают все процессоры там на планете. Ну, это дискуссионный ну, знаю, вопрос. Есть свои преимущества. Просветляющую оптику делают из фотонных структур, а по-моему, литографии традиционной. Mm -hmm. Это для матриц балометрических в тепловизорах. Mm -hmm. Там такая просветляющая оптика. Ну, все, спасибо. Думаю, да, ну, спасибо, вы это потом, я думаю, обсудите. Нам, нам очень важно создать э, беспогрешностную структуру, чтобы все было там параллельненько, чтобы там, на нужном месте стояли эти дифракционные эти штуки. Поэтому дискуссионный вопрос. Спасибо большое. Да, все, спасибо. Коллеги, ну, у нас больше нет докладов на нашей сессии, поэтому, наверное, кофе-брейк или там на обед у нас, да, по-моему, дальше. А, да, we have a lunch. And uh, thank you.
Okay, uh, dear colleagues, I welcome you on our third and the last session today on laser matter interaction. And uh, this session will be co-chaired by me, Anton Popov, and Alexey Kucherik. And uh, we'll have five talks. And uh, the, the first invited talk uh, will be given by uh, Igor Gladskich from Itmo University, St. Petersburg, Russia. And the title of his talk is uh, Optical Anisotropy of 2D and 3D Metal Nanoparticles Ensembles Induced by Optical and Mechanical Treatments. So, uh, Igor, you have uh, 20 minutes and three minutes before the end. I will stand up indicating that okay, you, you should finish. I represent the laboratory of surface photophysics in the international and research uh, international research and education center of phys for physics and of nanostructure in my university. And the topic of my report is related to plasmonic uh, nanostructures with optical anisotropy and chirality, and more about uh, the optical methods for obtaining for this structure. Uh, my presentation plan is, follow as, as, is as follows. Uh, first, I will talk about the localized plasmon resonance and uh, about the anisotropic uh, uh, properties and chiral properties of nanoparticles. Uh, then I will talk about the experimental results of mechanical treatment uh, for creating some anisotropic uh, films, uh, and then about um, method of uh, laser interaction, uh, about laser interaction with metal nanoparticles, and uh, about experimental metal uh, m results. So, uh, localized plasmon resonance is a collective uh, installation of all conduction electron relative to the iron core. Um, and it is observed in the extinction spectra as a narrow band. The position of uh, plasmon resonance uh, depends, of course, on the material of nanoparticles, on their size, uh, the dielectric environment, and uh, to a greater extent uh, on the shape of the particles. Thus, for a spherical nanoparticle, one resonance absorbed in the absorption spectra uh, and for example for triaxial ellipsoid there are free resonance in the spectra. Uh, the arrangement uh, of several particles also has a great influence on the extinction spectra. Um, then two nanoparticles approach to each other, their extinction spectra will also split uh, moreover, for anisotropic nanoparticles or anisotropic errors uh, the, of nanoparticles, the absorption will strongly depend on the polarization of incident wave. Such optical pro properties like uh, gained absorption cross-section and local, local field focused near the nanoparticles uh, make it possible to amplify small signal uh, for example, it's absorption, luminescence, or Raman scattering of nearby objects, including biologi biological. Uh, recently, the study of more complex structures, such as chiral nanoparticles, has become relevant. Uh, chiral objects, including metal, chiral nanoparticles and ensembles interact differently with left hand and right hand polarized circle polarized light. Some examples are shown on the slide. This can be uh, individual nanoparticles, anisotropic nanoparticles obtained by chemical synthesis or depos some deposition. Um, mm. uh, it can be isotropical uh, nanoparticles uh, on Mm, located on, for example, on DNA molecules or some uh, structures, uh, metasurfaces obtained by ion beam lithography or other methods. Of course, uh, interesting to the chiral and plasmonic is primary uh, 
due to the possibility of amplifying uh, weak uh, chiral signal from molecules. Uh, Moreover, it can be used, uh, for example, to control the polarization of light, uh, data encryption, and uh, photochemistry, uh, and others. Uh, here we demonstrate um, one of the methods for creation of anisotropic uh, uh, structure. Uh, it is a popular method. Then you uh, have um, um, a thin film with obtained into here uh, uh, metal nanorods, and then you strange uh, this film as a nanorods um, oriented. Uh, um, uh, along the strange, uh, and then the film acquires anisotropic properties. So, uh, on this slide, uh, presents absorption spectra of silver, and here for uh, gold nanorods in polyvinyl alcohol film after stretching a different polarization at, of prom beam. Uh, but this method is applicable for creation of three-dimensional structure, and for two-dimensional structure, colloidal solutions are practically inapplicable. In so the main uh, part of our work um, is devoted to 2D structures and based on laser modification of metal nanoparticles and structures. Weak laser la radiation leads to a selective uh, heating of particles, this plasmon resonance coincides, coincides uh, with the uh, uh, radiation wavelength. Uh, due to heating, these particles change the shape and the plasmon resonance shifts uh, and uh, such particles become non-resonant with laser radiation. And uh, this leads to the spectral hole burning in the extinction spectra of the film. Mm. So, uh, this increasing of uh, energy of laser pulses, uh, several effects associated with the laser-induced uh, heating can be absorbed. Uh, in particular, such effect as melting, fragmentation, and uh, as an extreme case, uh, ablation of nanoparticles are absorbed. Uh, the effect of laser irradiation in the spectral uh, region of quadrupole and dipole modes of the plasmon resonance of silver films are presented here. Uh, so, uh, and to the study by us earlier. Uh, so we see that the after irradiation, initially large particle breaks down into smaller particles with large changes in the absorption extinction spectra. But in all previous works, uh, less attention was devoted to the influence of the uh, laser beam polarization uh, on the optical properties of irradiated films. So. Uh, in this exp experiment, we considered the uh, effect of linear polarized pulsed laser radiation on the absorption spectra of silver nanoparticles. Uh, five n uh, silver film with equivalent thickness of five nanometers was, phys was physically vapor deposited in vacuum on glass surface at room temperature. Uh, and same images show closely packed metal nanoparticles with irregular shape. Uh, the initial film uh, has an in, in, in homogeneously broadened plasmon resonance with a maximum at about uh, uh, 550 nanometers. Mm. Uh, for silver sp spherical particles, for example, on dielectric substrate, uh, Typical uh, resonance is about uh, 400, 500 nanometers, depending on the particle size. And the rift shift is due to the complex shape of particles and their interaction due to the close packing. Under laser irradiation, uh, particles become more rounded, and you can see it on the same image. Uh, but in the absorption, 
uh, spectra, we observe significant, significant anisotropy between spectra with measured with probe light beam with polarization coincides to laser radiation and orthogonal to, to them. Uh, the spectral hole at the wavelengths close to the laser radiations absorb in both cases, uh, but in th then the probe beam coincides to the laser uh, radiation. The spectral hole is much uh, stronger. So the difference between this spectra is clearly seen uh, on the left uh, feature, on the right feature. Uh, on CD spectra, circle, uh, uh, linear dichroism spectra. <coughs> uh, so as the energy of laser radiation pulses increase, the single va signal values uh, reach its maximum at uh, energy about uh, 13, 17 millijoule per squared centimeters. And with use increase energy difference uh, between spec the spectra uh, starts to decrease. Also, we measure the circle dichroism spectra. The shape of the spectra uh, is similar to uh, linear di dichroism spectra, but the signal strength is quite small for plasmonic chiral nanostructures. It can be assumed that the laser radiation, by analogy with works on spectral hole burning, can selectively affect on structures of closely spaced particles. Uh, heating of two closely spaced particles will lead to the rounding and the increase of the and increasing distance between them. Mm. Uh, and this increasing of the distance between particles in the direction of laser polarization inc increase faster than the orthogonal direction. Uh, it can be assumed that uh, even a slight difference about a few nanometers between this distance uh, uh, give a uh, su sufficiently large d difference in the absorption of polarized lights uh, in, in the absorption spectra, in polarized absorption spectra. Uh, mm, the resulting structures uh, with linear dichroism can be used, uh, for example, to control the polarization of light. Uh, in this feature, uh, uh, circle and linear dichroism of two uh, films connected at different angles of rotation, uh, one structure relative to other. Uh, here, a positive rotation angle uh, means that the top structure rounded uh, clockwise. The minimum signal of linear of uh, circle dichroism is absorbed for angle of uh, zero and ninety degrees, and the maximum is absorbed at sorp, uh, at uh, rotation angle uh, forty five degrees. Uh, in addition, then the substrate was rotated negatively. Uh, the signal was mirror symmetric uh, relative to zero. And the LD signal is decreased uh, than the uh, rotation angle uh, uh, increase from zero to 90 degrees. So similar uh, research for um, uh, uh, nano rods. Uh, so here you can see some structure produced by uh, DNA origami methods, uh, and uh, for this structure you can vary the uh, chirality of this, of this structure. And for uh, our samples. Uh, uh, 
and the right figures uh, show our samples, the structure consistence c consisting of three samples at the same rotation angle, uh, so 45 degrees, and and then the third uh, surface rotated uh, with negative uh, negative direction. Uh, for comparison, the spectra for two samples as, as is present at the same rotation angle. The circle dichroism signal doubles, and uh, in the case the angle changes to opposite, the circle dichroism signal becomes uh, close to zero, uh, close to the and comparable to the signal of one uh, sample. Also, uh, chiral structures uh, uh, can be produced by uh, circle polarized uh, laser irradiation. Uh, uh, in this slide, uh, films with greater thickness of uh, 12 nanometers. Uh, Uh, so we have two different structure. Uh, the first uh, are the sample after deposition, and uh, uh, with complex labyrinth structure. Uh, in this film, of course, you can find some uh, uh, anisotropic on chiral, or chiral particles, but the total contribution to the to the uh, circle of dichroism spectra is close to zero because the self-organization process leads to the formation uh, of a random structure in which the contribution of individual anisotropic uh, and chiral particles are well balanced. After thermal annealing, the large rounded particles are formed and of course uh, the symmetry of particles decreases. Uh, this film was irradiated by right-handed polarized circle polarized uh, laser beam and the optical density uh, decreased signifi significantly for unannealed films. At the same time, we observe a large circle decreasing and the, uh, the amplitude of which decreases with increasing of energy. Mm. Some images show that the ablation process um, uh, and uh, for annealed thin the circle dichroism signal increase with the increasing energy the optical density values does not uh, decrease uh, so much and in addition the long wave long wavelength maximum appears uh, so same images shown that the addition to the initial large rounded particles uh, many smaller particles around them are formed during irradiation. By analogy with the previous case, the long wave maximum can be associated with the interaction of the particles and the spectra of circle dichroism will be determined uh, by their non-symmetrical arrangement. Uh, it's, it should be noted that irradiation with left-handed uh, laser beam give a mirror signal uh, in the uh, circle dichroism spectrum. So the uh, influence uh, of the dielectric environment uh, uh, on the circle dichroism spectra uh, was investigated. So we, we see that uh, uh, in in contrast to the absorption spectra, circle dichroism spectra usually have uh, several spe sp special points and you can track, ch uh, track changes of the sp uh, spectrum shifts in, in more detail, as can be seen for the uh, short wavelength maximum in CD spectra, the shift is four, is four times greater than for this, the shift of the maximum in the uh, optical density. And 
uh, returning to the colloidal nanoparticles, we demonstrate the, that the, these methods can be uh, used for 3D structures. Here, uh, the uh, porous glass uh, matrices uh, with uh, gold uh, spherical nanoparticles, small, small gold spherical, spherical nanoparticles were you irradiated by. Only one minute. Yes. Uh, irradiated by, uh, uh, by laser with circular polarization, and after irradiation, we see uh, a large signal in circular decreasing spectra. So conclusions, the possibility of obtaining anisotropic and chiral metallic nanostructures using optical methods uh, from an initially integrally isotropic stru structures what was demonstrated. Uh, slight laser influence is more applicable for complex film with in, in, in homogeneously broadened plasmon resonance and laser pulses with high energy uh, leading to fragmentation of nanoparticles can be used to create a kernel structure from uh, acryl uh, spherical particles. Uh, thank you for my, for my uh, colleagues and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Igor, for your presentation, and we have time for one really short question. Uh, is there any? So, okay, please. And uh, what is the difference between the coupling of the particles and separate particles? What is the difference of the distance? What is the distance with this coupling? And this was as big as separate particles. What is the distance? <laughs> the distance between particles is about... Uh, 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 several nanometers. Several nanometers. Yes. This is the di diameter of the particles. Uh, for first example, it's about uh, 13, uh, 14 nanometers. Thir 13, 14 nanometers. Oh, okay. And for the last uh, example, for fragmentate fragmentation film, I think it's uh, uh, about uh, 15. 15, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Let's thank the speaker again. And uh, this is my pleasure to uh, present you our next speaker. Um, and the next talk will be given by Alexey Kucherik from, from Vladimir State University. And the title of his talk is Laser Synthesis of Linear Carbon Structures for Develop of New uh, Optics Devices. So you have 20 minutes and three minutes before the end I will stand up. <laughs> but it is huge microphone, okay. <laughs> and thank you for your here because it's after lunch I would like to relax, <laughs> and no conference. Uh, but I would like to present you it's our new results about synthesis of uh, laser, <coughs> laser synthesis of carbon structure. And this one is, this, yeah. Uh, outline of my talk, I a little bit speak about this reason for synthesis of linear carbon chains and our methods of synthesis and possibility of application in optics, this structure. And a carbon family is very uh, wide family of materials and uh, to this position, this, ah, I cannot use it, pointer, okay. My hand like a pointer, this diamond is sp 3 hybridization materials, bulk materials, and graphite is sp 2 <laughs> and different forms between them. It is fullerens, nanotubes, graphene, and another one, uh, carbon dots. <laughs> And this another part of this triangle is hypothetic uh, carbon materials with sp hybridization. Is uh, linear carbon chains in ca carbine is this ultimate? It's infinite uh, carbon chains. It's impossible for synthesis. But now we uh, we now is this some different uh, forms from the sp sp2 is graphines when the some part of sp2 materials connected by linear bonds. <laughs> And sp3, like iron diamonds, where part of the sp3 materials connected between them, of the carbine bonds, and some variation of amorphous carbon when this uh, carbon chain is, is folded on the different structure. And this is wild new family of carbon materials for different application. 
And main reason for synthesis of uh, carbine is energy properties of carbine. Carbine is molecular materials. It means the carbine have energy gap in the space of energy. And because it is uh, carb uh, graphene is semi-metal, is uh, band gap is equal to zero. <laughs> and for carbine, we have a homa and luma, and gap between them level. <laughs> and this uh, gap changes from this 0 0.4 electron volts to the four electron volts. It means in the optical, we can detect that photoluminescence of carbine is visible area. It's visible range area. And the optical, uh, excuse me again, <laughs> and maxima of luminescence totally correspond to the length of the carbine. This, is, for example, this is eight, 10, and 12 atoms. <laughs> and it is very perspective for optical application. And for our laser community, it's best news <laughs> because is laser methods is very perspective for synthesis uh, carbon materials as different forms, or carbon two. If we use it laser, we can synthesize this area, this red line, carbines, <laughs> or this big area for synthesis different form of the carbine. And the process of synthesis strongly correspond uh, to the energy of laser radiation and pulse duration. And in our group, we use method of laser fragmentation of colloidal system. Our colloidal system in, consists from the water, amorphous carbon particles from shungit. Shungit is this natural mineral, consists from the amorphous carbon and some part of non-planar graphene, and uh, gold particles. And gold particles we use like a mechanical engine uh, for the stabilizing our uh, carbon materials in the different form. It's possible the two uh, way for the synthesis. The first one is a carbine, when one chain is uh, deposited between two particles. And another possibility is if some sp, sp2 materials that fall it on the, some big particles, consisted from the chains, fall chain, and uh, gold nanoparticles. And uh, this is schematic illustration of process of fragmentation system. This first part is this initial solution. <laughs> In process of laser radiation, we fragmented these particles and uh, they destroyed and formation of the different uh, carbon atoms and some short part of uh, carbon chain and gold particles. And after laser radiation, we have process of assembling in the time scale near of the nanoseconds and a few hundred nanoseconds and form it the part uh, step by step form this uh, chain is fixed on the first place of the surface of nanoparticles and another one. <laughs> okay, and how we can detect it? <laughs> and first one, we use a uh, nanosecond laser. In our opinions, we use a different laser source. And uh, in our opinions, it is more uh, perspective uh, for the synthesis because we can create this uh, <coughs> sufficient temperature and pressure in uh, water. And we have temperature near of the uh, 4,000 uh, kilowins is sufficient for create of carbine. This is start to the transformation from the graphite to the carbine. And uh, in our experiment, we used uh, nanosecond uh, laser with uh, pulse duration 30 nanoseconds and uh, wavelength 160. And okay, this is a Raman spectra of our system. This uh, bottom uh, spectra it is initial, it is amorphous carbon particles. <laughs> and next one, uh, when we radiate uh, our system without gold particles, and we have uh, the first peak transformation, we don't detect it's D peak, only G, increase the G peak. And this one, this near of uh, 2000 uh, centimeters, it is uh, area of triple bond of the carbon. And near of the one, thousand nanometers it is a single bond carbon and if we added in the system uh, gold particles we stabilize our system and we have very narrow triple bond peaks and narrow single bond peaks and some uh, part of the uh, sp2 uh, carbon so it's some part not fragmented particles it's usual for our same okay let's start again is 
it's demonstrated the deposited uh, colloidal system for the uh, transparent electronic microscopy. It is a big part of deposited layer. And this one, it is our carbon chains. I cannot demonstrate this one, this, but you can see this line with some kinks. It is usual problem for synthesis of uh, carbine. We cannot uh, deposit it uh, strongly aligned structure, only with kinks. Some part of the kinks is this, uh, 20 or 14 atoms and kink between them. This like, okay, no? Oh, no. This some schematic illustration of kink in our systems. And we can investigate our system by optical methods. This optical absorbent is corresponding to this carbon part uh, and gold nanoparticles. And our system have a visible luminization range. Huh? And uh, we have this uh, very uh, shifted uh, peaks of uh, photoluminescence because our system casting from the uh, carbon, uh, uh, carbon chains with different length from 8 to the uh, uh, 24 uh, atoms. And next question, how we can separate our system? How we can separate only uh, carbine? <laughs> and we use a very simple uh, scheme. We added in our colloidal system, two electrodes, and we use uh, uh, direct current. And main idea of our method, if we have this carbine, it is molecules, and this, this, this molecule can polarize in our directed current, <laughs> and without moving from another part, some another one. But if we have another part, is this uh, nanoparticles or some big part of uh, graphite, <laughs> These particles is electrical key, uh, have as an electro charge and start to the another or one part or another part of the electrode. And uh, really, it's a, another bit uh, change the situation, and we synthesis this very big uh, sponge, carbon sponge, consists from the SP and SP2 and uh, gold. Uh, to bottom images from the raster electronic, scanning electronic microscopy. It is really some. Uh, carbon uh, wires, this is big wires, this is uh, near of the some microns. And uh, this top level is this uh, transparent electronic microscope. It means this is some one of the wires is consists from the carbon chains uh, folded to the some tubes. And by uh, Raman spectroscopy, we can detect it what is uh, top panel is uh, initial uh, systems. And uh, bottom panel is this blue curve. It is Raman spectra of the big sponge, this is a wire of the sponge. And red sponge, uh, red line, it is uh, spectra consisted from the deposited liquid uh, from this uh, after separated. It is only carbine, as we have is D plus G peaks, plus G peaks, and long linear carbon chain peak, and it consists of the uh, is this placed near all of the, the 200, uh, 2,100, 100 nanometer, uh, centimeters. And we tested these materials. This is a real experiment with uh, changes the uh, wavelength of pump radiation. And we see how this changes the luminescence spectra of the uh, radiated luminescence spectra. And we tested our big sponge is really black body. Yeah, because we have this very high coefficient of absorption in the diapason from the uh, 500 to 2,500 uh, nanometers. Okay, it is first day. <laughs> Next one, how we can use these materials in optics? <laughs> and uh, first one, we need uh, some, okay. Uh, we need some oriented our st uh, structure in process of deposition. And how we now, we can use methods of uh, electro electrostatics with uh, splashing our colloid system uh, between, uh, between uh, two electrodes in uh, vacuum and deposited our c system like this zinc films. And you can see this first particles, next one, and between them <laughs> some carbon chain. 
and it's really we can test it uh, by Raman spectroscopy. And again, it's a very narrow peak in the triple uh, bonds of the carbon. It is very good quality films considered from the oriented uh, carbon. And if we tested these materials by photoluminescence in the, the temperature of the focaline, we uh, detected this dramatic change of photoluminescence. This photoluminescence is uh, very narrow peaks. <laughs> very narrow peaks is corresponded to the, we have uh, this uh, strongly separated materials with the uh, same uh, length. And this one is corresponding to the, uh, we can detect it as exciton in our systems. <laughs> this is the normal exciton situation where we have uh, exciton with a different energy. <laughs> And uh, it's possible, it's, uh, we calculated with uh, uh, scientific uh, team of uh, Mikhail Partnoy from uh, Exeter University, and calculated it's possible to generate terahertz radiation for the systems. And for gen generated of the terahertz uh, radiation, it's needed some ultimate length of the carbon chains. It's needed for the 36 atoms. <laughs> if we have this nanoscale system, we can generate terahertz radiation. <laughs> it's not as uh, big intensity. <laughs> what is really can generate it is terahertz. <laughs> Without uh, some microns, <laughs> it's only for the uh, nanometers uh, systems. And next one, and uh, what is changed when we added uh, the gold nanoparticles in our uh, carbon structure? And we used uh, synthesis uh, <coughs> uh, carbine without gold, is this one. It is some fold, it's not onion. <laughs> it is uh, like a fold and one chain. <laughs> and uh, next one is, is our deposited uh, carbine between two particles. And it means uh, carbine is molecular system. It means it have a homo and luma uh, level in the energy space. But if we added the connected uh, the carbon particles to the two uh, gold particles, we have added level, this Fermi level of the gold particles. And this level placed it between Homo and Luma level. It uh, means we a little bit doped our system by electron from uh, gold nanoparticles to the carbine. And it's uh, very simple to test. Uh, we uh, pumping our system and investigate the photoluminescence in the uh, black curve, it is initial system without gold, <laughs> and red, it is with gold particles, and we increase the intensity of photoluminescence. It's okay, it's no problem. And we have a, uh, new experiments with polarized laser radiation. <laughs> and our idea, if we have some uh, parallel massive of the chains, it is like similar parallel massive of the nanotubes, we have some rules for absorption, <laughs> And uh, we can uh, change the uh, absorption in the, our system when we can change the polarization of laser. Or we have, in this experiment, we have strongly paralyzed linear laser and rotate our plate. <laughs> and when we rotate our plate and uh, measure the photoluminescence, uh, this point, it is integrated photoluminescence, we really change the intensity, integral, in, 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 integral intensity of the photoluminescence. This means our system really change the absorption when process, when it rotate of our plate. It is a first step for the create of zinc film polarized. <laughs> and the carbon zinc film polarized systems. And, uh, and our new uh, idea is collaboration with scientific group of academician Vitaly Konov and how we can increase the concentration of carbine. <laughs> because main problem of our result is low concentration carbine. It is more less than one percent of all systems uh, transfer from the uh, carbon to the carbine. <laughs> and now we changed our experimental scheme. We use it uh, chlor acuric acid uh, with and use it uh, uh, laser with uh, wavelength of the uh, gold resonances of uh, uh, 532 nanometers. 
And main idea, we start this process of the growth of uh, gold particle in process of dissociation of uh, salt. And after that, when the, uh, some particles is created, we started the uh, uh, fragmentation of uh, carbon materials to the carbine. <laughs> and uh, we stabilized this system because we needed this, this more time for created uh, all of them. And this is special devices for the car uh, temperature stabilization. <laughs> and really, we can fix it at uh, two moments. The first one is after 13 minutes, uh, 13 minutes uh, after radiated, we can really, this is first one is this, uh, red curve is this initial system. Uh, blue curve on the Raman spectra is uh, after 13 minute radiation. And black curve after 16 minute radiation. And we really changed our system all time. We can really clear synthesis is a very long uh, chain of carbine. And we can change our system. We can change the time of radiation and change the long of our synthesis carbine. It is very good because <laughs> after that we can deposit it <laughs> and investigate it again. <laughs> and for our experiment, we deposited this structure, this one, and investigate how we can detect the photocurrent of our system. We pumping this system by green uh, laser. <laughs> uh, really, if we change the intensity of uh, laser radiation, we really change the uh, tunnel current in our systems. <laughs> it's really a very good photo detector for green radiation now time. <laughs> OK, it's my uh, favorite slide. <laughs> Without conclusion, is our big scientific group. I hope the scientific team of Academician Konov added in our big family, and we created a new possibility for the uh, application carbine in real optics. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Dear Professor Kucherik, thank you very much for a very interesting talk, and we have some time for probably one, two questions. So, who wants to start? Probably I can ask my question. So uh, I'm curious, uh, how do you uh, obtain your nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles? Do you synthesize them? Yeah, we synthesize it by laser ablation. It's okay. no problem for us in, in water. <laughs> okay, and the next question, uh, why uh, carbon is uh, binding to your gold nanoparticles? So what are forces which oh. bind them? This is <laughs> a very actual question. Uh, it is open question now, and uh, by uh, in our opinion, it's a very simple uh, situation when process of laser radiated, the first step in the carbon chains uh, uh, kept from the hydrogen. And hydrogen deposited on the surface of the gold particles. And uh, starting process of the cooling, the nitrogen is, is very weak bond, <laughs> and uh, we have these changes. This hydrogen atoms to the carbon atoms. <laughs> because carbon atoms is more chemical activity. <laughs> and started from step by step, <laughs> we connected this uh, part by part, uh, this uh, very long chain. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So do we have some more questions? Okay, if no, then let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you. And let's move to the next talk, and we have a small change in our schedule. So the next talk will be presented by uh, Nikita Petrov uh, from Itmo University from St. Petersburg, Russia. And the title of his talk is uh, Intracellular Trafficking Using Plasma Resonance in Silver and Gold Nanoparticles with uh, Arbitrary Shape. So please, you have 20 minutes. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Nikita Petrov, and I would uh, like to thank the organization of the, this conference to, for the invitation of the opportunity to tell you uh, our research. And today I am glad to speak you with the report in intercellular uh, traffic using plasma resonance in the uh, in silver and gold nanoparticles, this uh, arbitrary shape. Uh, my report uh, 
consistence of silver parts, uh, we will touch a little of the metal nanoparticles and uh, their uh, properties, uh, the main problems and uh, their application. And I will also tell you about your numer uh, numerical modeling on, uh, and the future experiment research. At the end, we will discuss the technology, what we have to develop for the synthesis of the oligomeric nanoparticles using the laser ablation and uh, uh, sub, sub question uh, post processing. Uh, the, uh, the main object of our research is the plas uh, plasma nanoparticles. They are called plasmonic because uh, of their uh, inherent effect of uh, localized surface, uh, surface plasmon resonance. Localized surface plasmon resonance uh, is the inherent collective electron uh, oscillation uh, excitation that they arise in the metallic uh, nanoparticles. Among the dis uh, distinctive uh, properties of plasmonic nanoparticles in compression, compression the, this bulk metal, they can be uh, uh, distinction uh, is uh, uh, highly, uh, highly localized electro electromagnetic near field, uh, special uh, 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 sensitive to districts surrounding, uh, biocompatible, and uh, tonality of the op uh, optical. Uh, properties in the wild spectral range. For example, the optical uh, properties of the small nanoparticles, uh, nanoparticles is already uh, determined by the nanoparticles' own uh, sp specular uh, absorption, while for large nanoparticles, the role of the scattering uh, contrib uh, contribution uh, inter in 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 irreversible. Uh, the optical properties of the single nanoparticles can be determined by calcula calculating for existation cross-section, which is the sum of the absorption and scattering cross-section of nanoparticles. Is the thanks to the plasmonic uh, properties of the nanoparticles, uh, what they have proven uh, themselves so well in the many areas to, of research and application. So today the metal nanoparticles is uh, activity use, used in the uh, research of the drug delivery, photodynamic uh, therapy, photothermal therapy, uh, all of theirs uh, direction, amply the metal uh, particles, uh, Inter interact with the cellular object in our own way or in our truth endocytosis uh, capture of the nanoparticles or exocytosis. Uh, however, at the moment, the understanding of the mechanism of endocytosis and exocytosis of nanoparticles from cell, which mainly depend uh, on the uh, psycho chemistral uh, property of nanoparticles, uh, for example, the shape, size, surface change, surface chemistry, and uh, cytotoxicity. Uh, and uh, one of the way to monitor of endocytosis of nanoparticles is to detect the spectral shift of the plasma resonance. Earlier, our colleagues proposed a new method of monitoring and the those both of uh, both by change the frequency of plasma resonance and the re registration magnitude of le of the splitting of uh, uh, plasma resonance, which is uh, observed when a nanoparticle of, a nanoparticles uh, ap uh, approaches in the interact with the different uh, uh, primitivity. Due to the fact that during endocytosis, the, the electric primitivity of the environment become, uh, become less uh, homo uh, homogeneous, or the degeneration of the plasma resonance direct along the motion of the particles is removed, which we can see in the site. Uh, 
in the slide. Uh, therefore, uh, the aim of our works was to numerically and experimentally uh, revolve the optical properties of silver and gold nanoparticles uh, when passing through various dielectric media, then uh, simulate the endocytosis. Uh, to begin this, we determined the uh, optimal size of nanoparticles, uh, demonstrating the great spectral shift by calculation the existing cross-section spectra uh, for silver and gold uh, nanoparticles in uh, homogeneous media, one of which is the neutral medium for cell with the reflective index uh, in equal uh, 1.33 and uh, depend uh, on the graphics with the solid lines. Uh, and the other is the approximate intercellular medium with the reflective index is equal 1.4. It is important to note what in the addition of the displacement of the polar resonance, uh, displacement of the quadrupole resonance is the absorbed for the serial particles with a diameter of 18 nanometers. This is a, a uh, blue blue point uh, on the slide. Uh, to begin with, the determining the optimal size nanoparticles, uh, demonstrating the grace. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> at the uh, at the next step, we develop a more uh, approximate model of endocytosis, talking into account the cell uh, membrane and the dielectric primitive of the intercellular matrix. You can see uh, the model parameters used on the slide. Uh, gold and silver nanoparticles with a diameter of 20 and uh, 18 nanometers approach the center of the cell at each step on the model iteration. After the particle uh, reach the membrane, it's kind of the push it, uh, choose it uh, turns uh, out of the simulate uh, the real process, process of uh, phagocytosis when the cell uh, uh, swallow uh, nanoparticles uh, as it were. Uh, data for the optical properties or uh, for silver and gold nanoparticles. Uh, uh, we taken from the work of uh, Johnson and Chestry, optical construct of the uh, noble media uh, metal. The plasma resonance was uh, exist using uh, linear polarization We well uh, uh, perpendicular to the parallel of the movement of the nanoparticles. Uh, the following slides uh, show the graph of the plasmon of the position of plasmon resonance peak depending on the position of the nanoparticles uh, relative to the cell membrane boundary. At the point zero, the particles are already ha half inside in the cell. At this point, the plasmon resonance uh, degener degenerates again, but this is the uh, sub subsection progress uh, deeper into the cell, uh, the generation is again removed until the position then the uh, homogeneity of environment does not uh, case uh, to after the particles. I would like also um, to draw your attention of the uh, graph, the plasmon resonance of the particle with a diameter 18 nanometers, uh, because it show not only the graph of the pole, uh, but also the quadrupolar resonance, which also uh, has to remove uh, dangerous for a severe particle with, uh, for a severe particles. Uh, uh, these are ge geometer, uh, geometer 20 nanometers. The displacement of the dipole resonance was approximate seven and a half nanometers. And for a silver particles with a diameter 18 nanometers, nanometers it was uh, uh, 13 and half uh, and seven nanometers dipole and quadrupole resonance respectively uh, similar graphs were obtained for a gold nanoparticles for a uh, particle with the diameter of 20 nanometers where displacement of the quadrupole resonance uh, was approximate, uh, approximately <laughs> 
and uh, a half, uh, a three and half nanometers. And for a uh, gold nanoparticles nanoparticles whose diameter 18 nanometer, it was 12 and half nanometers. Uh, the final results of our modeling uh, can be colored graphic of the magnitude, magnitude of splitting plasmon resonance, which uh, uh, shuffling uh, changed the remo uh, removal of the danger of uh, degeneration of the plasma resonance as a result of endocytosis. The great splitting value was observed in the dipole plasma resonance of the cellular nanoparticles with a diameter of 18 nanometers and is equal um, th uh, three and a half nanometers. It's a right graph. Uh, a local continuation of uh, our sim uh, simulation, uh, uh, logical, continuation of uh, our simulation was the study of the optical properties of nanoparticles already in the laboratory. But uh, first you need to create the nanoparticles uh, uh, themselves uh, self-level. Uh, for this uh, purpose, method of the laser ablation and the chemistry uh, synthesis of nanoparticles were, uh, were chosen. Uh, detailed parameters of the creation and synthesis of nanoparticles I'll present on the slide. Uh, it is, it's important to note uh, what each of the method has been both uh, its uh, advancement and uh, disadvancement. Uh, for example, is a advance and advention of uh, laser uh, ablation is the, that there is no need to use a stabilizer uh, which uh, can be toxic to living cell and which uh, resuit the uh, certain sen sensitivity of nanoparticles to the dielectric environment. After synthesis of nanoparticles, uh, it's, ne it's necessary to check how they uh, will interact with biological media. This part uh, of the research is developed to uh, modeling the uh, formulation of, uh, of uh, vesicle uh, during endocytosis of plasmon nanoparticles using a protein shell made uh, of uh, moving serum albium, BSI. Uh, worse, uh, reflected index is uh, chosen to the uh, near reflective index of the most uh, cell membrane. Uh, when nanoparticles plasmon resonance, uh, uh, ah, I'm sorry. Uh, when nanoparticles and BSA interact, a uh, protein crown uh, is formed on the particles due to which a shift in the peak of the uh, plasmon resonance occurs. Uh, for serial nanoparticles, apparently by different methods, a maximum shift of uh, about seven nanometers is. Uh, observed, which is greater than the gold nanoparticles, uh, apparently by chemistrial uh, synthesis, three nanometers, and the laser along five nanometers. Uh, the results uh, obtained uh, are in good agree with the data uh, obtained by numerical uh, modeling uh, in the slide number six. After the uh, after the syn mm -hmm. after the upsync layer from the protein crown, we also con conducted study to the stability of the optical properties of the nanoparticles in neutral media, which are used uh, in incubating nanoparticles in this cell. For this purpose, uh, culture media for the a simulation of RPMA and DMEM a cell were used. Then compared with the spectrum of pure media, it was found the uh, then uh, then nanoparticles uh, obtained by laser ablation have a essential uh, solution and uh, stability. Nanoparticles uh, up obtained by chemistrial uh, synthesis are unstable and uh, 
aggregate uh, quite easily, which uh, leads to the displacement of the uh, characteristic peak of the plasmon resonance. As for uh, gold nanoparticles, uh, uh, obtained by the chemistry method due the fact uh, that the setup uh, chain length or uh, is so longer than the of uh, silver stabilizer then uh, aggregate to a larger extent however than uh, eight optical destiny in the in this case of the gold is due the intercellular uh, Indirect uh, absorption of RPMEA and DMEM uh, due to the plasma resonance of the nanoparticles. Therefore, so the future research it's more expensive to use uh, uh, nutrient media without uh, dyes. We have also developed a new uh, and uh, relative simple physical method to creating uh, left cellular oligomers uh, previously obtained by uh, pulsed laser ablation of the metal target in, in, uh, in a liquid. Of the oligomers were obtained in a, uh, across solution after centrifugation uh, for uh, 120 minutes and uh, uh, Subsuation, uh, ultra sanification for five and seven uh, seconds of the individual colloidal uh, solution is the spherical nanoparticles. This plasma resonance of the oligomers is shifted uh, relief to the plasma resonance of uh, spherical LF in the long valve region by 140 nanometers. And uh, you can see all of our conclusion on the slide. It is important to note uh, what the work uh, we have done. It is a good uh, preparation for the future experiments on the study of endocytosis already, already, uh, already in vitro. Our research uh, brings us uh, closer to the comp uh, to understanding of the biological process that it's uh, that is well for me a special thanks for uh, SCF to supporting the project and I'm ready to answer any of your question okay thank you very much for your presentation and I want to ask the first question <laughs> Uh, so, did I understand correctly that you want to uh, uh, track the position of the plasmon resonance and decide whether your nanoparticle is inside the cell or outside, uh, right? Yeah, it's uh, correct in uh, these graphics. Uh, I try to Okay, find. good. But yeah. then you also demonstrated that the formation of uh, protein corona leads to the shift of the plasmon resonance. And this corona is formed before the nanoparticle gets into the cell. So, how are you going uh, to? For for us, it's uh, very important important to understand uh, uh, stay the uh, corona on the uh, nanoparticles, or it's uh, just uh, stay liquid. Uh, and this is the two different parts: uh, uh, the nanoparticles and the uh, BSA. And uh, after uh, uh, union, the nanoparticles and the uh, BSA, uh, we can see the shift. Uh, and, but in this reason, we can s say the uh, BSA made the crown on the nanoparticles. Yeah, it's correct. But it, it's a well-known fact that the corona will form very rapidly. And uh, it will form before the nanoparticle will get it inside the cell. So how you can decide whether an nanoparticle is inside the cell or outside if the position uh, has already changed before the nanoparticles get uh, inside? It's uh, not uh, 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 the uh, made the crown on the nanoparticles. It's not a uh, 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 point of, of the list to find the position of uh, nanoparticles in uh, 
in the in the Zitosis. Uh, they made we made the crown uh, just for understanding where uh, where was the uh, peaks of plasma resonance uh, on uh, on the process. Okay, we can discuss it later. So okay. some more questions. Yeah, one more. And why the reason is use is uh, silver nanoparticles in biological application because it's silver it is very good antibacterial materials and another one uh, we use the silver nanoparticles because they have a, a really good yeah i understand what is uh, silver nanoparticles have is uh, good uh, cells properties and optical response and another one but i think there's no one cells can live on the surface of the silver nanoparticles mm, i think i can uh, uh, answer on your question right now, uh, but uh, it's a very good question to uh, thinking. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, speaker, again. <laughs> and now my part <laughs> of our session and our next speaker, <laughs> Kuder IEG. Yeah, it's correctly from uh, Prokhorov General Physics Institute. <laughs> Вот третье. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My name is Kudara I am postgraduate student at uh, Prokhorov General Physics Institute. And the topic of my presentation is uh, uh, laser synthesis of ruby nanoparticles for photoconversion of solar spectrum. Uh, it's now um, uh, that uh, <coughs> to obtain the energy in the process of photosynthesis, uh, plants use uh, mainly quantum uh, of uh, blue, uh, violent, and uh, red uh, region of solar spectrum. Uh, but uh, in this region, uh, <coughs> in this region, uh, radiation of uh, uh, in this range, radiation is uh, rather small, and. Uh, uh <coughs> To increase uh, the radiation, uh, 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 we can do photoconversion uh, 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 with radiation. And uh, 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 nowadays, uh, polymer uh, uh, coating based on semiconductors or, uh, or uh, organic dyes uh, photoconvert. Uh, <coughs> uh, photoconvert uh, uh, radiation into th this region, but uh, uh, their uh, <coughs> coating are not stable under sunlight and uh, uh, rapidly degraded. And uh, uh, ruby-based uh, mat materials uh, can be can uh, can become alternate alternative of, of these uh, uh, converters uh, be because uh, <coughs> ruby uh, characterized uh, uh, luminance uh, <coughs> strong luminance is. Uh, Near uh, 700 nanometer, and uh, uh, and it's uh, photostable. Uh, and uh, <coughs> ruby nanoparticles uh, can be at obtained by uh, laser ablation of uh, <coughs> ruby crystals. Uh, however, ruby crist uh, most available ruby crystals are uh, uh, laser ruby crystals with uh, content of uh, chromium only 0.05 percent, and uh, uh, as uh, uh, as photo uh, conversion uh, coatings, uh, concentration of uh, chromium uh, should be uh, higher. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, a direct laser uh, synthesis of uh, uh, ruby uh, crystals uh, with uh, a high uh, uh, concentration of chrome uh, uh, is uh, necessary. And uh, <coughs> Uh, as, as the aim of our uh, work is a uh, study to, uh, of the process of uh, laser synthesis of ruby nanoparticles and its uh, uh, luminescence uh, uh, properties and application of uh, polymer uh, uh, composites uh, with uh, ruby nanoparticles as a basis uh, for photoconversion coatings. 
Purpose of uh, work, uh, generation of ruby nanoparticles uh, using laser ablation and fragmentation technique uh, in liquid and investigation of their optical properties. Uh, ruby nanoparticles uh, can be uh, uh, were synthesized in two steps. Uh, first, uh, laser heating of mixture of uh, industrial alumina and chromium uh, uh, powder in air. Uh, schematic of the of this experiment uh, you can see uh, on the slide. And uh, in this experiment, we use a neodym yak laser with uh, the next characteristics. And uh, let's move on the result of laser heating. And uh, on the slide, uh, we can see of macro view, uh, macro view of uh, ruby grains. Uh, they have uh, average size uh, one millimeter. And uh, uh, these uh, grains uh, agglomerates, uh, agglomerates uh, uh, spherical uh, ruby particles. It means uh, 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 ruby uh, particles occur uh, via uh, melting. And uh, on the next slide, uh, we can see photolumic spectra of uh, ruby grains. Uh, <coughs> It characterizes uh, luminescence uh, uh, near 700 nan uh, nanometer and uh, <coughs> under excitation by a laser at a wavelength of uh, uh, 400 uh, uh, 5 nanometer and uh, 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 content of chromium more than 5% uh, shows uh, photolumens uh, very weak uh, comparing uh, uh, with 5% uh, and it's upper the uh, limit of uh, uh, contents uh, uh, chrome. And uh, uh, crystallographic uh, uh, data shows uh, that uh, uh, ruby is a hexagonal uh, lattice and uh, at the same time initial uh, alumina oxides uh, uh, powder have a hexagonal uh, lattice and uh, another uh, phases. <laughs> the next step of uh, obtaining uh, ruby nanoparticles is a laser fragmentation of uh, ruby grains. Uh, schematic of the experiment on, <coughs> on fragmentation of ruby nanoparticles is shown and the same uh, uh, laser uh, we use uh, in this experiment. And uh, uh, dynamic light scattering uh, uh, sh uh, size distribution of ruby nanoparticles shows uh, we have uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, with size uh, less than uh, 100 nanometer and uh, the size uh, with, uh, with size uh, uh, 200 uh, from 200 to uh, 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 500 uh, uh, nanometer and. Uh, in photolumen spectrum of uh, ruby nanoparticles is the same with uh, ruby grains and uh, ruby nanoparticles uh, uh, were in, in, in incorporated uh, of uh, incorporated of uh, uh, fluor fluor polymer LF32 its polymer used it, uh, in greenhouses coatings and uh, now on the next slide, uh, uh, you can see luminescence ma uh, map of the fluoropolymer, uh, pure fluoropolymer LF, uh, and uh, we can see uh, photolumens uh, at uh, uh, from uh, uh, from 300 to uh, uh, 500 uh, under excitation uh, from uh, under excitation. Uh, Two hundred fifty uh, from two hundred fifty uh, to uh, four hundred, and uh, on the next slide uh, you can see uh, photolumens uh, map uh, of uh, nanocomposite uh, uh, fluoropolymer uh, with na uh, ruby nanoparticles. Uh, we uh, can see photolumens of uh, fluoropolymer and photolumens of uh, ruby. And uh, uh, in the experiment uh, of uh, effect of photocomposite coating for greenhouse based on ruby nanoparticles, uh, uh, 
uh, ruby nanopart uh, this nanocomposite increase uh, surface area of uh, uh, surface area leaves uh, uh, more than uh, uh, more than 30 percent and uh, we think it uh, it uh, it, it connects with uh, uh, high uh, photosynthesis rate. And uh, now I would like to emphasize by uh, main points of my presentation. First of all, is uh, photostable ruby nanoparticles were synthesized by laser heating of uh, mixture and uh, further laser fragmentation of generated ruby grains. And the spectra of, of the fl uh, fluor polymer nanocomposite uh, with ruby nanoparticles demonstrate high photoluminescence peak uh, near of uh, 700 nanometer and about of uh, 400 nanometer. Uh, greenhouse polymer based on laser generated ruby nanoparticles is accessible and economically uh, feasible method in, uh, to increase the biomass of the land plants. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, we, we thank the uh, grant of Ministry of uh, Science of Higher Education and uh, scholarship uh, of the president of uh, Russian Federation for Young Scientists and uh, Graduate Students and industrial uh, partner pokers. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, now I will be happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for a very interesting talk and some question. Oh, okay. Ah, thank you. Can you switch previous slide? Ah, yes. Um, yeah. What difference between these uh, salads? Uh, uh, Only um, number A is a control group is uh, only with nanoparticles difference or in spectral radiation. Uh, in spectral radiation uh, too, uh, because. Uh, uh, Air, air, uh, red region of spectra to uh, uh, blue uh, part of spectra is... Uh <laughs> yes, it's well-known fact uh, for salads uh, that um, um, red uh, light um, make, it, uh, make it become more bigger. Uh, That's a theory of irradiation of salads. Uh, you should uh, irradiate more red light uh, in spectra, but maybe without uh, nanoparticles you can achieve these results. Uh, <coughs> uh, can you re repeat, uh, please, uh, question? Uh, может без наночастиц вы можете достичь такого же результата просто со спектром? А, ну спектры это есть, ну то есть вот, а, окей, it's uh, the spectrum of uh, uh, under without nanoparticles, it's A, and uh, B, это under with nanoparticles, ruby nanoparticles, and uh, in, in, uh, uh, in this case, uh, under uh, the uh, coating with uh, nanoparticles, uh, incre increase uh, of uh, surface area of leaves. And, uh <laughs> <laughs> because now we have time. Only one question additional. No one. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and last talk of our session from, I don't have a name, Prof. Alexander Nashivochnikov. <laughs> okay, are you here? <laughs> done, okay. It's, it means our session is closed. <laughs> and now I ask you to the poster session in the второй этаже у нас. Coffee break and after that to the go to the next. Yeah, ne next our session is cancelled too. 
and after coffee break we will go to the poster session i ask you my friends go to the poster and have some question in this session в 4 да 5 они уже я думаю что можно сейчас уже вешать да и поскольку мы с вами получается самые первые будем вот можно спокойненько походить вот, поспрашивать, авторам будет приятно. Все. Всем спасибо, коллеги. Остались самые стоящие.